Hello, AV Rant listeners. Uh, we are once again just behind the scenes before beginning our actual recording session. This will be uh, AV Rant number 492. So this is not quite the beginning of the podcast yet. If you're watching this YouTube recording of it uh, later on, Lee and I are uh, here with uh, Tom away this week. We were hoping producer Austin would join us, but he's uh, he's not around Right he's now. a I don't lousy know. rat fink hardly, he hates us hardly. he doesn't want to be part of it the man the man <laughs> needs to work sometimes so yes i should get uh lee to talk for a little bit here just one second i'm gonna switch over because what i'm doing right now is trying to check our audio levels and see if uh if this is working out all right so lee you go ahead and talk there for a bit lee is now talking for a bit i've set my behringer mixer to uh zero db going into my behringer mic processor which by the way has a buzz i think the power supply is buzzing anyway nothing ever works right for me <laughs> <laughs> yes okay now i'm watching the live feed so we sound quite all right so all right, i'm going good, to good. uh I'm going to assume that will remain the case. And what I'll do is I'll throw up our logo. We'll have a few seconds of silence and we'll start into the podcast. So let me see if I can get all that arranged. I got to get me one of these good lower third graphics. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. My name is Rob. H, I'm acting as your host this week for Tom Andre, who is away, and I am here with Lee Overstreet. I'm AV Rant pitch hitter, a pinch hitter. That's what I call myself every time, and color Absolutely. commentator. Yes, yeah, and we very much appreciate uh, that you've once again come in here on short notice. Although we, we gave you a little bit of notice, I did this, have. I, it, was like, like it was like a whole like a day. day. <laughs> that's right. That's that's a lot when it comes for Lee. That's yeah, I think the the record luxurious. was like two hours. <laughs> that's, that sounds about right. Um, we were hoping that our producer Austin would be able to join us, but unfortunately, he must be busy. He hasn't uh, been able to show up just yet. So yeah, we're gonna hop right into it here. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions and answered and uh, we got a whole bevy of bevy of questions uh to get to today and and luckily i have lee here so i'm gonna give him the honor of uh of reading through all the questions and comments and news items that we have but before we do that we would like to thank our listeners of the week uh listeners of the week are people who have supported the podcast in some way and this week we have jerry d to thank uh for his donation Yay, uh, if you jerry come to, d. Yay. thank you very much jerry yes if you come to our website which is avrant.com uh over on the right hand side there is a support the podcast link uh that says uh, buy us a cup of coffee that's just a metaphor it's for a paypal donation you do not need to have a PayPal account. You can just use a credit card if you'd like to support the podcast financially. Uh, now, you don't have to support us just financially. You could uh, write to a retailer or a manufacturer from whom you've bought products and just let them know that you heard the recommendation on AV Rant. Lots of people do that. And I just wanted to mention that uh, there are very likely other people who either donated or supported the podcast in some way. Tom is the fellow on this podcast who takes care of all of that uh ah, and so tom since, is saving up for that personal jet that's what he's oh, there, that could be. be an av rant jet with the logo on the side <laughs> it's so important uh, he needs it he needs it to do the show well well at, at the rate we've gone nine years in i i think by the time he's about nine thousand, and if he saved every penny and, and put it with <laughs> compound interest then we might get there but uh no he he manages all of our listener of the week content so uh, since he's away this week there's every likelihood that there were other people who did support the podcast whose names were not mentioned this week please feel free to write to us and remind us uh that you did support the podcast we will definitely mention you next week when tom is back yeah and plus so you get to plug something if you want to right absolutely yeah you get to say a few By words about a thing that's important to you for sure yeah so uh the way you get in contact with us is by emailing us question at avrant.com that's our primary email address that goes to our producer austin he manages our topic list and uh wrangles up all the questions for us but you can also cc myself rob at avrant.com and tom at avrant.com it's great if you email all three of us that way everybody gets all the information uh we also have a facebook page facebook.com slash 
slash AV Rant Podcast. We're quite active over there. And uh, our listeners are also very active. Help uh, answer questions right on the fly there when people post to our Facebook page. And we're also available on Twitter. I am at First Reflect. Tom is at AV Rant underscore Tom. Our producer, Austin, is at Austin Pond with a T E N, not a T I N. And Lee. Yes, people Lee. People in touch with you as well. On you Twitter. can find me on Twitter uh, at Lee Overtweet. Mm-hmm. See at how Lee clever Overtweet. that is. Yeah, because your last name is Overstreet. Overstreet, but it's Overtweet. Lee That's over it. at Lee Overtweet. They have puns. That's right. Our producer, Austin, also has his own podcast. It is called We Watch Movies. And I know with a title like that, it's hard to know exactly what it's about. I know, but I couldn't believe it's nothing but quilting. That's right. That's right. The title is a little confusing, but Mm -hmm. uh, man, all the stitching patterns and materials and stuffing and (laughs) interviews with little old ladies, it is adorable. Absolutely. We Watch Movies. Case case it wasn't clear uh so yeah like i said lee is going to be handling all of the reading this week because you know why, <laughs> why would i do so i'm not used to it tom usually does it i'm not all gonna right. do it i'm happy Lee's to read here. that's right so if uh, there's one thing readings. i can do is read words into a microphone <laughs> <laughs> that's i did that for years <laughs> <laughs> well why don't you start us up with the news there's some good stuff this week so. yeah this is kind of interesting yeah. uh first item here epson announced their 5040 ub projector mm-hmm. coming in august for 29.99 that's 2999 dollars <laughs> a 1080p three chip lcd but it can wobble the panels for that 4k enhancement mm-hmm. quote 4k enhancement uh which i'm wondering how that isn't kind of like interlaced television in a way well because, i mean they're running it at like 120 frames per second but then of yeah. course you're only doing like one half the first 60 and the other half yeah. the other. so it's, but it's kind of like forth. interlacing a little bit yeah little which bit. direction does it wobble horizontally diagonally or? Diagonally. Diagonally. <laughs> Diagonal interlacing <laughs> they, is they, what that really is. They right? shift them by a quarter of a pixel diagonally back and forth. And so that's why it's not really 4K resolution. Yeah. It's pseudo 4K, but that's but what you do. But you do get an enhancement. Yep. Uh, it's, yep. it's got a motorized zoom, lens shift, and focus. And that's great. That's the yeah. first time that on these non eight thousand dollar plus epson models we've had motorized zoom focus and lens shift so i'm personally yeah. excited about that do you happen to know if it has memory for different zoom settings or yes it does yeah oh, it's got at, at least two if not more i know it has at least two though so you oh, can this... do the poor man's version of anamorphic which is zooming in to fill up a very yeah. large screen or a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio screen and then zooming out to fill up a smaller 16 by 9 areas so that's exactly that what i was thinking when i read this finally <laughs> Uh, it claims to be able to show the entire DCI P3 color gamut, uh, which I'd like to ask you more about, uh, Rob. Uh, a filter <laughs> is put in place when you select the digital cinema picture mode. Now, is that a mm-hmm. physical? A filter is put in place. That's a software. Yeah, an, yeah, an, a- an actual filter goes in front of the lamp um, so wow. that it, it, it changes or if it's not in front of the lamp, it's in front of the LCD panels, one or the other. Uh, but yeah, it actually filters the light to make sure that you go to the full DCI-P3 color gamut. This is actually the first display I'm aware of that is claiming to hit 100% of DCI-P3, because even like the OLED displays in that are saying they hit like 99%. Um, so they're saying, nope, we do the full 100, and the DCI-P3 color gamut is what is used, not surprisingly, in the digital cinemas. If you go out right. to the digital cinemas, that's the color gamut, and it is wider than the Rec. 709 color gamut that we normally use for our HD TV and Blu-ray content. So it's uh, deeper shades of colors, including things like Coke Can Red that's actually in there now, which you oh, can't quite show. I do recall Coke, Coke Can, can Red. Red never that's worked right. on NTSC that's television. Right. It doesn't work yeah. on 709 either. So Interesting. H- so it could, you can't even do Coke Can Red on a high def TV. That's right. Not, well, not one thing. Completely, I'm, so. and, and this is go- here's a note for something to discuss later. I'm curious about the various color gamuts and how they compare and what they're used on. I think that might still be swimming around in people's heads and kind of confusing. Uh, yeah. Because I also wonder how it fits. Because the only thing I know about color gamuts is taking photos, sure. like at weddings and events. And the color gamut on my computer screen and the JPEGs I'm generating for people, that's sRGB typically. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'd like to know how that matches up with these other color gamuts. And will I see an improvement in my uh, (laughs) uh, home photos if I have a higher color Ah. gamut television and Mm. I view those photos over DLNA? Anyway, that's a interesting thought well, that's, oh, we, we can dig into it a little bit i mean what's happening with a color gamut is that you are all, all they're doing is they're selecting specific coordinates for red green and blue everything yeah, yeah. eventually comes back to red green and blue 
Right. And uh, there's a there's a, we have this sort of horseshoe shaped gamut that was developed in 1931 by the CIE, uh, and that right, shows all pretty little conical rainbow thing. Yeah. that's like a graph of all the colors, all the so colors that the human eye can perceive. Triangular shaped conical thing. Yeah, so they, they basically, I mean, somewhat arbitrarily pick a red, a green, and a blue out of that, and then right. you draw the triangle that results from those three points, and everything that fits inside of that triangle is called the color gamut. Right. Right. So. In video, we have uh, what was called SEMPTC, which eventually was the official thing for uh, the old uh, standard definition, which we're not using too much anymore. Right, uh, it was, was very limited. And, and I don't That's think right. most people kind of get the concept of it. Like there's the whole range of colors your human eye can see. Yep. The TV can't make all those. Can't make and, all those. And I don't think right. most people ever considered that yeah no that's it's it, it all it is is that uh the the wider you make the color gamut the deeper the shades can get mm -hmm. so uh you can get a deeper shade of red you can get like a neon green because that's way up right. at the top of the graph more like saturated and intense green. the color and uh, and we we actually never get a true violet because it always is a blue it's a very very deep, deep yes. blue very very close to violet but we never get true violet and, and that's so. true on digital slrs as well uh yeah. there's I, I there's a particular thing i like to talk about in color there's a uh, a, a camellia or an azalea, an azalea in mm -hmm. my yard mm -hmm. with blooms that are this intense purple color, mm -hmm. and it feels like you're looking at ultraviolet or something. It's <laughs> it's so intense, and you cannot reproduce it yeah. on anything I own. That's right, and uh, there's there's essentially nothing that can if it's a true violet. What we usually call purple in television is actually a shade of magenta. Right? Yeah, that's that's what we're actually usually talking about. So yeah, when it comes to translating like photography into video, it's difficult because photography uses different color gamuts than video yeah. does. And there has to be a translation between the two. Right. So if you're starting with a uh, photography gamut, like say sRGB or Adobe RGB, right, and then Which you're is even wider. and then you're translating that into a video gamut that exceeds the photography gamut right and that's what this new rec 2020 gamut which is what we're using for ultra high definition yeah for that, hdr and the like yeah yeah for for ultra high definition is, is yeah. what it's for we have okay. this rec 2020 gamut now which exceeds srgb it exceeds adobe rgb so as far wow. as uh what the display could understand it would understand everything in a photography gamut and then some. Right, okay. Uh, but then it's a matter of what the display can show. So there, we don't have any displays right now that can show the full Rec 2020 color gamut, except for some sort of prototype laser-driven displays. Oh, my. Um, so, you know, it, it's all a matter of, okay, now we have a system that could understand the photography gamuts and exceed them, but now we need a display that could actually show them. So it's all right. just a matter of translating these three points of red, green, and blue. As long as you can encompass whatever those three points of red, green, and blue are, and actually display it, then you could show things as long as you have the translation function so that the actual shade of red that you want is the shade of red that you see. Right. So uh, am I correct in my instinct that if I had an HDR high definition television, a 4K yep. TV with HDR and a wide color gamut, yep. I will see more colors out of my sRGB color gamut photos on my digital SLR. Yes, you should. Then I the, would. The, the sRGB gamut is is very close to the same size overall as the Rec. 709 gamut, mm -hmm. but the points of those colors are slightly shifted. Ah. So even though the size of the overall gamut is similar, mm -hmm. you don't get the exact same colors, whereas Rec. 2020 certainly exceeds it, and then DCI-P3 is large enough that it should encompass all of sRGB and then some. So as long as the translation algorithm, As long as the translation good, is correct, then you'll see the correct colors, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so, so it's I, complicated. See, I'm trying to ponder whether there's an advantage for me to buying a 4K television with such there, limited there content. There certainly out. could be. However, you... It, it it depends on whether the things are translated correctly. One way right. to do it would be to translate the photo uh, the photograph yourself first Oof, into that's a not video gonna, gamut. Not going to happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about umpty billions of pictures I've taken uh, over the years with digital yeah. cameras with all sorts of standards. Yeah. So no. Anyway, the point is yes. on this per particular projector that um, what we're getting with Ultra HD Blu-rays and Ultra HD content that you might be streaming in Dolby Vision or HD. 10 from Amazon or Netflix or Vudu or a service like that. Those are all using this new Rec 2020 container, this huge color gamut, yes. uh, but they're only putting DCI P3 colors in there. 
I so see. now this Epson projector is claiming they can produce all of those DCI P3 colors uh, stuffed inside of a Rec 2020 container. So basically, right. you should be seeing extremely accurate, very deeply saturated, deep shades of color that we so couldn't 2020 see. 2020 is the blue. biggest. Gambit. That's the biggest one we got right now. And within that is contained DCI. All, all other gambits that fit inside. Everything it. else yeah. is smaller than that. That's right. So yeah. the best, okay, I got you. Yeah. Anyway, this particular, uh, going back to the yep, single that's right. story that I've deviated from, uh, it supports HDR10 with claims of 2500 lumen output capabilities. So great range from brightness oh, to yeah. black. Uh, there's the Pro 6040 UB version 2, which has a black case instead of white. Includes dedicated ISF day and night picture modes. That's nice, and comes with a spare lamp, all for mm -hmm. thirty nine ninety nine. So That's four right. grand, that ain't bad. I'm yeah. standing there. Well, I'll tell you about my Best Buy experience at some point, but <laughs> I'm standing there looking at prices, and hey, that's not bad. That's starting to get reasonable. So we were talking about when are HDR capable projectors that can actually do something impressive uh, going to start coming down in price? Well, if three thousand dollars sounds reasonable to you, and that's that's not insanity at, anymore. You know, that's not ten thousand right. dollars plus anymore. Uh, so you're not getting true 4K resolution, but you're doing the wobbled panel. But everything else, you got genuine HDR. You got lots of brightness. That's for darn sure. And uh, and you've got uh, this full DCI P3 color gamut, so I'm I'm pretty impressed by this. Looking forward to it very much. Obviously, I haven't seen this, but uh, I have a very nice Epson scanner, mm -hmm. so I like that brand name. <laughs> So next story. Next story. Amazon has begun streaming some Dolby Vision content. There are nine movies, just nine movies, all from Sony Pictures and one original series, Bosch, which I assume is about dishwashers and washing machines. Uh, not uh, that I know uh, of, though. It's a, I, I don't actually know what that show is about. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Only LG's built-in app works at the moment, and Vizio's Google Cast version will need an update. So if you have an LG TV with the proper app to do Amazon streaming, you can get some Dolby Vision content with the great color gamut and the uh, wild brightness and yeah. yeah, so I actually made a bit of a mistake there. Um, on the Vizio Smartcast apps, uh, you can't get Amazon streaming at all. Oh, it's, it, they, they don't so it's have not going to happen. <laughs> they don't have a Google Cast app, so hopefully they will one day, but they don't right now. So Vizio does have their reference series televisions. Yeah. Uh, those do not use Google Cast, so uh, those actually do have an Amazon app. So uh, there should be an update coming for that one for the reference series, but those are really expensive. So uh, uh, many people have bought the Vizio P series because it has both Dolby Vision and HDR10. And unfortunately, you can't view this new Amazon Dolby Vision content uh, via that Vizio P series or Vizio M series just yet. So, so. is there yet a standalone? alone little box player that can do uh, HDR that can do so the Nvidia shield is now capable of outputting HDR 10 okay uh, I not believe Dolby vision but not Dolby vision uh, and, those are and two believe... competing standards by the way for listeners who That's haven't right. followed it closely <laughs> HDR 10 and Dolby vision two competing standards for the HDR for the uh, yeah I mean they're not necessarily coloring. competing because Dolby vision can be a it does super two different set. things yeah Dolby vision can be a super set of HDR 10 it can actually yes. have HDR 10 as its base layer and yeah. then layer on what it does on top of that so they don't necessarily have to compete but yeah for all intents and purposes if you have Dolby Vision content, but you do not have a Dolby Vision television, then you cannot view it in high dynamic range. So, yeah. So <laughs> LG has some LG. interesting things to offer. Yeah, that's that's it. So, uh, yeah, uh, another story. SVS sent out an exceedingly nice and complimentary tweet about AV Rant this past they week. They sure did. So uh, welcome to any new listeners who found us because the, that uh, SVS has also introduced their new sound path pivoting wall ceiling bracket. It's primarily meant for their SVS Prime satellite speakers. It has a weight limit of 7.7 .7 pounds, but it can work with just about any brand of relatively small speaker that has a threaded insert, and most of them do. And it comes with plenty of hardware to give you lots of mounting position options. I, I did look at that picture, and it's nice. It's a little ball joint. Yep. So you, you, there's a little bracket that mounts. It's a ball joint like your shoulder. You just aim it anywhere you want. Of course, all the pictures on their site show it without any speaker wire so it looks super clean install right. you're like uh <laughs> you need one more thing <laughs> yeah you're so uh something. they're just expanding their uh, sound path accessories line and yeah with the 7.7 .7 pound weight limit uh, you know unfortunately there's a lot of speakers that uh that we often recommend that will exceed that weight limit so this is meant for smaller speakers for sure within svs's own lineup it's really only the prime satellite that would uh work with this particular bracket but 
It is whole, a universal bracket, though, essentially. It is, yeah. And the yeah. whole point is that it, it's very handy for people who want to mount speakers up high or from the ceiling for Dolby Atmos or DTS-X. So that's really what they're targeting with this. And uh, yeah, nice that they're expanding that lineup. They're uh, $40 for a pair, so uh, they're not super duper expensive. So not too bad. So there you go. That's yeah. the news. That's right. So I will just let Lee know, I, I, I sent you like 20 minutes before we began this podcast, an even more updated topic list in your email account. Okay, there. hang and on. I, what tipped me off was that uh, that Vizio uh, P-Series Google Cast thing there. So the whole reason uh, I bring that up is because no, we have it's... a question. I, I completely forgot about that Tom mentioned last week, but nonetheless, our comments haven't changed. So we can okay. head on into those. All right, great. I've now opened the proper document. <laughs> I'm doing the same show as you now. Great. Yay. <laughs> Our good friend Herb uh, from Cross Spectrum Labs wanted to say he appreciates AV Rant mentioning and recommending their calibrated measurement microphones. And he's sure it has resulted in an uptick in sales. As such, he wanted to get the word out to AV Rant listeners that unfortunately supply is going to be very limited for the next few weeks, possibly till the end of the summer. And uh, Cross Spectrum Labs is a small business with a small group of staff members. So unforeseen circumstances can sometimes mean disruptions to their normal business. Uh, Herb wants to avoid disappointing anyone, obviously, who is interested in buying a calibrated microphone from them. So the hope is that by mentioning the situation on this podcast, our good listeners will be better prepared for the expected wait times and will hopefully understand that Cross Spectrum can't ship out purchases right away. That's mm -hmm. Kind of understand. They will get back to normal operation, temporary situation, but it's a uh, heads up in case uh, there's some wait times over the summer. So be patient. Yeah, yeah. and we, we appreciate Herb so much, and we love what he does with uh, what he does is he takes like the U mic one from Mini DSP or the uh, Dayton audio measurement microphone. Uh, he takes those and calibrates them against a very, very expensive and very, very precise microphone and creates a correction file that you can load into a program like Room EQ Wizard yeah. uh, and have a very, very accurate measurement, more accurate than what you could get just oh. with a stock microphone. And it's very affordable. So I, I've chatted it up. I'm sure people are interested in it. Unfortunately, if you order one right now, there is more than likely a wait time and it could be somewhat lengthy. So we do want to warn yeah. people that's the situation. They'll get back to normal. We'll absolutely let you know once that happens. So the the OCD side of my brain loves the sound of that. <laughs> yes. Uh, <that's laughs> I can get it perfect. <laughs> uh, also via Ray Coronado, mm. uh, Lion AV maintains a list of active THX video calibrators listed by country and region and that yes. link will be on the AV Rant website I assume that's right. Come to avrant.com. Uh, we have our show notes there and we post the links to uh, products that we recommend and uh, articles that we talk about. So yeah, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a, a listener asking about how to find a good video calibrator. Uh, I didn't know about this particular list, but Ray himself is a video calibrator. And so he's like, hey, here's a list of THX certified video calibrators listed by where they work and with their contact information there via links. So very, very handy. We'll have that link at avrant.com. As a point of reference, Reference. What's a typical cost if I went to Best Buy and bought mm -hmm. a 65 inch TV, mm -hmm. an LED television? What's a typical cost to have a calibrator come to my house and get that nailed down perfect? Usually it's between three and four hundred dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. That that seems to be the going rate. Some are a little bit more, some are you know a hair less. Um, but it, it can depend on how many sources you're having them calibrate uh, as well. Because if you have a whole bunch of sources or multiple displays or something, then of course the price is going to go up. It's it's sort of a time and how many things they have to do situation. Okay. But they also have very expensive light meters. Uh, a lot of these guys use like yes. seventeen thousand. And twenty thousand dollar light meters, sometimes more than one of them. So uh, yeah, it's 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 worth it because if you were to purchase that equipment, it would take you many many televisions to make your money back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's what they're doing is trying to make their money back. I'm that's just right. curious, uh, you know, that doesn't oh, yeah, sound no. unreasonable though if you are really into oh, and particularly if you're getting a you know a high end OLED that costs eight thousand dollars or something. What's three hundred dollars on top of right, that to make right. it look its best, right? So, right, right, yeah. Uh, via Tyler F on Twitter, uh, vinyl feed, vinyl fied, vinyl fied, vinyl fied, vinyl fied is a website that lets you add imitation vinyl hiss and crackle in the background while you listen to streaming music services. Hipsters rejoice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for of all course, the that link will be there too. But oh my goodness, really? Now, yeah. I when I used to do a radio show back in the day, uh, I had uh, some 
filters and add-ons for a program called SoundForge. And mm -hmm. we did uh, a comedy bit once that involved uh, some we're pretending to be old records we found. Sure. And we, we did. So now you can do that live and ruin your already compressed music. <laughs> so, yeah, for, for all the people who say this, this isn't sounding fuzzy enough. I don't hear that. that uh, <laughs> I mean, that it's adorable, going. but yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Moving on via Chris I on Twitter. Uh, HDTV test in the UK did a comparison of HDR10 from an Ultra HD Blu-ray disc versus the same movie, Pan is the movie, mm -hmm. in Dolby Vision, which is available via Vudu streaming in the USA, but since they're in the UK, they got a special copy on a USB stick. Yeah. Okay, so they're comparing a little bit apples to oranges, but just to see, the test was done uh, on an LG E6 OLED. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that the consumer one I see at Best Buy? Uh, yeah, possibly it's like top. There's the G6 just above it, but yeah. they have the same picture quality. The G6 just has a, a different design with a separate sound bar. So because I um, kind of fell in love the other day. Yeah, this is it. top of the line stuff. This is like the pretty much the best TV that's out there. As yeah, far the as one I wanted was goes. you know like five grand. Uh, yeah. And they discovered suboptimal tone mapping and some highlight clipping when the HDR10 was used. Uh, so the Dolby Vision version looked better mm -hmm. uh, when they showed the same HDR10 Ultra HD Blu-ray disc on a Samsung SUHD TV. The differences were negligible. Yeah, so, so this is an interesting thing because we've been talking a lot about HDR and we've been talking about this static metadata, which is used in HDR10 versus dynamic metadata, which is used right. in Dolby Vision. And the whole idea is with the dynamic metadata in Dolby Vision, Dolby comes in, analyzes the TV, understands how bright it can get, how wide the color gamut can go. Right. And then dynamically on a scene by scene or even a frame by frame basis, mm -hmm. takes the original content and accurately maps it to what the TV can That's do. That's a lot more sophisticated. So each TV yes. would, in a hardware chip, I assume, have stored its own data about what it's capable That's of. Right. Yeah. And then every frame or scene in a movie talks mm -hmm. to the TV, and every moment is optimized. I like That's the sound right. of that. Yeah, but whereas according HDR10, to... they set it once at the beginning and leave it alone, which right. means that if the, what, what is called tone mapping is when you know the signal says, this scene should be 2,000 nits bright, but the TV goes, I can only show you 600, right? right? So you have to map that down. And what they're saying is in this particular LG uh, OLED, which is an OLED, so it can't get to a thousand nits. It tops out at about 540. Uh, it's not perfectly mapping that down. It's not perfectly mapping the stuff that is a thousand mm -hmm. nits down to its 540 capability. It's clipping some of it off or the yeah. colors aren't quite translating just right, which is exactly what Dolby was worried about and why they developed Dolby Vision. So uh, yeah, it, it's saying there's a real world case for it here. However, if you have a TV like the Samsung SUHD that that can go all the way to a thousand nits, which is where the HDR10 content is mastered in this case, then everything is shown accurately. So it doesn't look any different. So, right. you know, it's a, it's basically just a real world demonstration of exactly the theoretical stuff we've been talking about. But I'd say what, what's interesting is, is it, I can see this future opportunity for so much arguing and bickering and, and measuring and testing and whose TV has uh, a better <laughs> range and who translates these scenes uh -huh. better. And I can, I know what's coming in the future is people are going to argue about individual scenes and movie. Well, go look at what the oh, sun yes. looks like and, and look at the explosion in this scene in this movie. And that's what <laughs> proves that this TV is better than that TV. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> but I mean, the clearly it's really happy. They have actual differentiators now. Yes, once again, <laughs> because it, honestly, it was kind of getting to the point where most TVs looked pretty darn good mm -hmm. uh, for 4K and, and, and deep color is such a new world. It's going to be <laughs> fun. Uh, another item, Samsung held a one hour clinic during CE week to show a new evaluation setup disc and CalMan workflow. C-A-L man, not, not cow, right. like moo cow, cow man workflow. It's an ultra HD Blu-ray disc with HDR10 content mastered at a thousand nits. Cal man is now programmed to work with the test patterns on the disc, which is not publicly available. Mm. You can't necessarily fix or adjust the HDR TV if it tone maps things incorrectly, which is why they called it more of an evaluation disc than a calibration disc. So it's kind of like the security monitor versus a security guard. <laughs> yeah, you know, it just tells you, yeah, this TV is terrible. <laughs> it, it'll let you know that it's doing something wrong. Can't fix it, but it'll yeah. let you know. So yeah, um, it, it is tough. Uh, with CalMan, they, they are the makers of SpectraCal, which is by far the most widely used software for video calibrators. Um, yeah. In the Dolby Vision system, Dolby works hand-in-hand -hand with CalMan, with SpectraCal, 
and they give them what they call golden reference targets for every individual model of Dolby Vision TV that's out there. And if so it's it, golden, it's, it's better. Well, it, what it means is Dolby looked at the TV <laughs> and said, this is how bright it gets, this is where yeah. the colors go, and here's how you should be able to calibrate this television, because there's still unit-to-unit -unit variation, right. and there's still differences in the viewing environment, so you're right. still adjusting your brightness and contrast, and everything sort of shifts along with that. Right. Uh, so Dolby Vision gives them these, these golden reference targets to be able to hit. In HDR10, no such thing exists. Mm. HDR10... The metadata is just there that says, here's what the mastering display could do. We have no idea what this TV can do. We're going to take a guess at it, close our eyes, hope for the best. And uh, so that's what this evaluation disk is basically saying. It goes, okay, this is how it was mastered. We know how it was mastered. How does it show up on your TV? If it shows up poorly, can't do anything about it, but at least you'll know. So, so I wonder how long it'll be before really any average person can tell the difference between an HDR10 standard and a full Dolby Vision setup where everything is calibrated. I, I wonder, because like right now, if you stuck HDR10 in front of me, I'd be uh -huh. like, oh my God, it's beautiful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You put Dolby Vision in front of me. Oh my God, it's beautiful. It's going to be the, the same. The reaction. average consumer will never, ever care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, really, I mean, it's... It really never. Uh, well, yeah, not the average consumer. <laughs> Some people are going to care a lot because yes. you know oh, how yes. people are. Yeah, that's right. Moving on again. <laughs> uh, Ted Masana was prompted by something uh, this podcast said to check the color gamut setting on his plasma TV. And he found it set to native, so he changed it to natural, and it looks much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah so that? talking about this whole wide color gamut thing, on older televisions, uh, yeah. they could sometimes exceed the Rec. 709 gamut. Like, the TV itself could yeah. show deeper shades than what the Rec. 709 Makes signal. me wonder about my old plasma. Yeah, uh, so a lot of them gave you this, they would call it native color, which said, all right, Instead of accurately showing you the signal, we're going to expand artificially the colors so that you can use all the color capability of what the TV can do, not what's in the signal. Even because though you have no signal that can yeah, accurately do that. Everything yeah. comes out inaccurate. So we mentioned that. Amazing. And we mentioned that, and Ted heard that, and he's like, oh, all right. And he's like, and, oh. Now and he says now, the correct color. Ray's speeder in Star Wars 7 no longer looks crimson. That's right. Yeah, because it's more of a terracotta, right? That's, that's the reason that's right. to do it. Anyway. Well, as an Alabama fan, I like Crimson, so, <laughs> you know, Roll Tide, work so, that in uh, there. So, yeah, as we said, this is AV Rant. Uh, we answer your home theater and AV questions on this podcast, and I'll throw out the contact info once again, because we're going to get into our questions now. If you want your question answered, just write to us. The email address is question at avrant.com. You can also CC myself, Rob, at avrant.com, or Tom at avrant.com. So get in touch with us, throw us a question. we got lots to get to, so let's hit it. All right, Matt G is our first questioner, and I'm opening his little picture right now of his uh, beautiful <laughs> tower speaker. And uh, okay, I've got to look at it now. Matt first says, thanks for discussing his question two weeks ago regarding the discounted $500 Polk speaker package he was considering to replace his Boston acoustic speakers. He wanted to make certain we knew he was talking about the Polk Audio Monitor 70 speakers and not the, quote, weird looking satellite speakers that were also called m70 uh that, so that's m70 versus monitor 70 right, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but regardless he got to demo them anyway and he thought the polks and his boston acoustic speakers were very close in performance he maybe preferred the boston acoustics tweeter and maybe preferred the polks slightly quote fuller sound but it was basically a toss-up so and that, that's that that's happens. kind of what Tom and I predicted. So good to know we weren't way off the mark on that. So that's right. Just a little confirmation there. Uh, <laughs> he has his front main speakers crossed over at 80 hertz, but he's always used a smaller center speaker that can't even play that low. Uh, during his demo, he was using a phantom phantom center setup, and he noticed he really liked the fuller. There we go again with full, fuller and more natural sound of voices. So how important is it to have a center speaker that can handle? the full vocal range on its own. Well, yeah, so this gets back into, and this will come up later again, um, this gets back into the whole thing of, it depends a little bit on your room size. Um, mm -hmm. If you're in a very small room, then, and you're sitting fairly close to the speakers, then even if the speaker really only plays down to 80 hertz, and let's say it just drops off a cliff below 80 hertz, and right. some speakers kind of do, if you're in a fairly small room, then, um, you know, that bass from 500 hertz down to 80 hertz is still going to be plenty loud. 
Mm -hmm. And then you transition over to your subwoofer and it's not going to be a problem. But you take that same speaker that just falls all the, off a cliff below 80 hertz and you put it into a significantly larger room. Now you still have all the bass from 500 hertz down to 80 hertz that that speaker is supposed to be producing. Uh, and some of that is just starting to get lost in the size of the room. There's um, more air in that volume of space. That's right. And we talked sound in. pressure level. That yeah. word pressure is right. is apropos that's what it means it's pressure um so you know when you have a larger volume of air to pressurize and then a smaller speaker that simply can't put out more and more output in the bass and that again it's everything below 500 hertz we're not just talking about the deepest bass below 80 hertz right. um so yeah the, it sounds like he's got a little bit larger room than what his old center channel speaker could handle uh, it doesn't mean that that center channel speaker couldn't have worked well in a smaller room with less air to pressurize right uh, but that's really what we're dealing with so and also yeah. uh, i when people say fuller uh, I, it does yeah. tend to mean that sort of upper bass it definitely can. so the bottom end of like male voices yeah, and, which can be like 250 hertz, something like right, that. Which and, your subwoofer isn't really playing a whole lot there. Right. You know, it's down 48 decibels by that point. So it's the subwoofer is very quiet up at 250 hertz. Your speaker's handling most of that. If you have a larger room, more air to pressurize, then you need the speaker that can simply do that. I think a lot of people also say warm. Oh, there's that. To, to mean the same thing. Although yeah, sometimes yeah. warm means not harsh treble. I, I, just, right. I'm, I try to translate between what people are trying to say <laughs> and what the word it because these yeah. words don't have official definitions. Kind of subjective, you know. that's right. Very much. Uh, <laughs> we asked him for his budget and room size. He'd consider spending as much as $2,000, but would actually really like to hear our suggestions if they differ. For if he had 1000 to spend, 1500 or 2000 he wants lots of different possibilities. He'd prefer <laughs> to get five speakers within each of those budgets, and you mm -hmm. can do it at any budget. Just uh, depends on where the quality starts to make a difference. Yeah, so honestly, when you're talking uh, anywhere from 1000 to $2,000, um, you know, certainly from what you could get at a thousand dollars for five speakers to what you could get at two thousand dollars for five difference. speakers, yeah. it, there is a pretty significant difference in there. Um, but the the sort of caveat to that is there's this range in between and sort of like twelve to fifteen hundred dollars where right. you can get some very good speakers where the stuff you could get at two thousand dollars really isn't significantly better. Yeah, I've, um, I've just from the things I've seen, it you know that sort of graph of uh, uh, price to performance ratio, mm -hmm. and, and and it has that point in the curve where it begins to shoot upward. That's right. Right. Okay. And somewhere in that curve is where you want to purchase things most yeah. of the time, unless you have a hefty budget. And that's great. Have a great time, you know. But that's like 1500 is about where it starts to yeah. not make as much difference per dollar that you spend more. But yeah. you can do better than $1,500. Setup. Yeah, so you know what what I would say, uh, particularly the frame, because he mentions he has his room is like thirteen by twenty five, which you know thirteen by twenty five. If we assume an eight foot ceiling, then you're you're verging on three thousand cubic feet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so this isn't a gigantic room, but it's a large room, which makes sense that if he had that smaller center speaker he was talking about, maybe it's you know the bass is getting a little bit lost in there. Right. So and I would he's really... nine feet away. Yeah, yeah. Nine so feet. you know the distance from speaker to ears is by no means the issue. Uh, it's more the room size. Right. Uh, but I would just say that like the Ascend Acoustics, I mention them frequently, but the Ascend Acoustics, they're CMT340 speakers. If you had three of those across the front and you match them with a pair of CBM170 uh, surround speakers, uh, and if you got the pedestal stands for your front left and right CMT 340s to make them look like towers, they're, they're not actually towers, but you can make yeah. them look like if you want to. You put all <laughs> that together and you're talking like 1300 1350 plus some shipping. So like we say, getting, getting right into that sort of $1,500 mm -hmm. range. So you're over the $1,000 mark. Now, the difference from what you get for if you stuck yourself to $1,000. Yeah, see, now you're be, under 200 per speaker. That's right. So you're talking like the Pioneer Andrew Jones speakers or maybe the, the smaller ELAC debut series speakers, right? That's mm -hmm. what I would point anyone to for if you have to stay under $1,000. And as you've pointed out, those Pioneer Andrew Jones speakers can make a very impressive home theater. Oh, heck yeah. Oh, yeah. heck yeah. But I would say there is a clear improvement going from the Pioneer Andrew Jones speakers to these Ascend Acoustics CMT340s. Yes. So it's hard 
for two thousand dollars to improve on those ascend acoustic speakers that's right. what i'm talking about so right. if you're in this range between a thousand and two thousand that's a huge value purchase would be those ascend acoustics se series speakers i would also throw the emp tech impression series speakers in there um now you don't really need that in this type of room size he's under three thousand cubic feet those emp tech e55 towers that they have they can get crazy loud right so if you've got five thousand cubic feet to deal with then i'd point you more towards the mp techs but that's not the situation so i'll give that recommendation uh i i think i mean, tom would certainly agree with the mp tech suggestion um but yeah that that's sort of what i'd be looking for in that price range gotcha uh his boston acoustic speakers uh, were very large bookshelf speakers on stands mm -hmm. and the po the polks that he's demoing are towers and they sound here we go again fuller sure so how important is it to get towers i, I think it depends on the sound pressure you need right and yeah and, and and a tower isn't inherently going to have more bass or inherently play louder th louder than every bookshelf speaker out there right um you know it, it is a case-by-case -case basis but of course if you have a larger cabinet and more drivers then right. typically it makes sense that yes that speaker can play louder well, for instance so, i have those yamaha towers yeah. that have side mounted 15 inch woofers they sure. are essentially subwoofers and they're ported out to the front yeah those and you're things, not going to find that in a bookshelf speaker <laughs> those sound very full yeah well, at least they can right <laughs> they so, sure do <laughs> so yeah when you're dealing with your room size you know under 3,000 cubic feet but but larger than just a medium-sized room uh then having that base output capability from at least 500 hertz down to 80 hertz uh it is significant it is certainly audible uh but again i was mentioning those ascend cmt 340 speakers now technically they're bookshelf speakers because they're not towers they don't stand on their own unless you put them on their pedestal stands sure. uh, but i would put those speakers up against virtually any tower speaker at their price range or even you know a fair bit higher uh because they have tremendous output capability so you know like i say it's a little bit model specific it doesn't have to be a tower speaker what matters is can it output the base that you need that is suitable for your room size and uh, what matters is do you like how it sounds to your ear holes yes very much so that's always the <laughs> bottom line if you, if you feel better when you hear those fuller tower speakers then get yeah. them yeah but you never never my, forget my point is don't just go to yourself oh here's a bookshelf speaker you know technically in the case of the cm2340 right. uh it sounds fantastic in my room it has all the base output i need but it's not a tower so i can't even consider it you know i don't want right. people to think that way that right? would be very wrong yeah. yes that's why I, that's what's so frustrating where i live in a smaller city is i've got best buy and that's the end of the list and so i can't hear these things and it's super frustrating i need to make an audio only vacation to atlanta <laughs> because that has everything they have beautiful uh av stores there uh we mentioned how we're not fans of odyssey 2 eq and how it doesn't even eq the subwoofer output which does seem like a strange omission and capability yeah. but without buying a new receiver right away is there anything he could use to eq just his subwoofers and the answer is yes absolutely there is the mini dsp uh you're talking right. about a hundred dollars for the unit itself it has mm -hmm. two inputs and four outputs you just want the basic uh rca plug version of it so it's about 100 i think it's 105 dollars so right it's a very so cool little device you you yeah. you plug a usb port into your computer so you're just attaching this little mini DSP to a computer like a laptop or something mm -hmm. and you tweak that EQ perfectly yeah and you do need a microphone if you want to measure what your subwoofer is doing uh, you know at the beginning right. and then have the program room EQ wizard generate a inverse curve that'd be a good in a good use of one of those cross spectrum labs it sure would and microphone. that's where we would normally be pointing you and you still I, we still will as long as you're willing to uh, absorb the wait time that's happening right now uh but if you don't want to wait for uh for herb at cross spectrum to uh, calibrate your mic for you you can just get the u mic one that is uh directly from mini dsp that is about a hundred dollar microphone or uh dayton audio also has a very good uh microphone that's about eighty dollars over at parts express um so you do need a microphone now if you have an spl meter that has uh, an output on it because many SPL meters have a, just an RCA jack on them you can use that too uh, and room EQ wizard includes correction files for SPL meters because SPL meters are not perfectly accurate particularly in the deep base right. uh, but they have sort of a, a compensation uh, program that built right into room EQ wizard for SPL meters so that is a perfectly reasonable way to do it, especially if you're going from 2 EQ to just using an SPL meter with room EQ wizard and a mini DSP 
that's still way better than what 2EQ is giving you. So this right. doesn't have to cost a you know, huge arm and a leg, certainly doesn't have to cost as much as a new AV receiver, and that's how you do it. That's one way to add on if you're happy with everything else. Uh, continuing with Matt, we are now on Matt's subsection E to his question, <laughs> Roman numeral 4 sub A part 2. Do we discuss specific cable satellite providers? He's had Comcast and TV, and just recently switched over to Dish. He really likes the Dish equipment and their hopper set-top boxes. They've worked flawlessly, which he can't say for the other two providers. However, mm -hmm. Dish's picture quality is the worst by far, he says. Mm. That's surprising. Uh, why is it so much worse than DirecTV? He's heard the newest Hopper 3 looks better. Is that true? He's considering using a front projector in the future, but he can't imagine increasing the image size would look good. Now, to me, I find that surprising that you would say worse by far. Yeah. The, yeah. Something else feels like it's going on there when you it say really by does. far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I, well, first of all, I'm in Canada, so I have no firsthand experience with the various United States uh, cable and satellite TV right. providers. So I can't talk to that from firsthand experience. But just going by the research I could do on, you know, uh, support forums and stuff like that, there does seem to be a general consensus that... Um, because Dish is still using some, uh, their satellites are a little bit older, right. and they actually kind of like repurposed some of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and it seems like they do have a little bit less <laughs> bandwidth than DirecTV. To, like DirecTV is going whole hog into 4K transmission. Right. Uh, Dish, not so much. Uh, so some of it could just be bandwidth constraint. Uh, there's been talk that quite a few Dish channels are actually broadcast in 1440 by 1080i resolution instead of 1920 uh -huh. by 1080i resolution. That well, might it have all a little depends. something to do with it. Doesn't it all depend on that bandwidth? amount the megabits per second it's is really primarily what it, comes it does to, right? and then some people were saying like over in the west coast because they have two satellites one for the west coast one for the east coast in the west coast a lot of the channels are still using the old mpeg 2 compression still haven't transitioned oh, over to mpeg 4. that would so make a difference if he's in the west coast and he's watching stations that are in mpeg 2 and dish has more limited bandwidth to begin with and it's an odd resolution that has to be scaled you put all of that together and i could see it yeah, looking yeah, a little okay, bit okay. worse, which people I have commented. That. Now, I don't know. This To me, this is all secondhand knowledge, so I can't right. tell you for sure that that's what's going on here. Uh, but it could explain it. Now, the by far, of course, is a subjective term. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, but um, it's possible. It's, it seems like it is possible for all those reasons. It seems like if you have the newest hardware that can at least use the MPEG-4 uh, channels that are broadcast in MPEG-4, mm -hmm. that that should improve the quality. So that could explain what's going on there. That's if you right. have a little bit older equipment versus the newest. So uh, it seems like there could be a reason for it. Uh, it doesn't seem like he's just completely pulling it out of his rear end or anything right, like right. that. There are, other, yeah. there are other people mentioning it. So. I can testify to Comcast, been with them for right. years. Uh, it's a terrible company with just <laughs> just a terrible company but the actual service is pretty good weirdly right. on comcast and this might be true with all the other providers too uh there are differences from one channel to the next depending yep. on how important they think that channel is yep. or how many viewers it gets and yep. i swear nfl network must have some deal with comcast that says you have to carry every last bit of our bandwidth you cannot can shrink that. it down yeah because it looks freaking fantastic and you can flip <laughs> to another a game on like the same day at the same time flip to some different game on a different channel and it does not look as good right and right. and and i think there's probably differences from one locality to another the things yeah. they can change so uh every channel is different some can be quite noisy and not even really look like high def and then sure. you have the problem with your broadcast networks carrying all those side channels yes. eating up their own bandwidth and they don't they just pulling it out of the air instead of getting some higher bandwidth version of their main channel so right. the channels are different all over the place and some of them look like poop and some look fantastic <laughs> yep and it's that. just all over the place with content so, yeah so it's it seems like that could be could be could um uh, hopefully the idea is that you wait long enough and they'll upgrade their equipment but shooting a new satellite up into space could be a, a an expensive venture for any company so uh yeah it it seems like that is just just the way it is i'm sorry about that matt <laughs> Not much we can do about it. Uh, moving on now to Mark O, which is exciting because someone else has the last name that begins with O. Mark O, Mark's room is approximately 17 by 22. He's using five NHT Super Zero speakers and one SVS PB2000 in a 5.1 setup. Sounds nice. He says he's happy with the clarity of the sound, I bet. And for movies, it's very enjoyable. But when he listens to music, it doesn't sound as, here we go, full-bodied as he would like. And He's this is not a surprise. Those NHT Super Zeros are very small speakers. He's another person yeah. with about a three thousand, about a yeah, three thousand cubic foot room, roughly. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, the uh, same advice that we were just giving. Uh, a little and, more and sound pressure at that upper That's base right. area is yeah. what you're looking for. That's right.
Uh, uh, he's considering the EMP Tech Impression Series towers, mm -hmm. uh, Ascend Acoustics Sierra One bookshelf speakers, mm -hmm. and Aperion Audio Veris Grand bookshelf speakers. They're all fairly close in price, around seven fifty a pair. And mm -hmm. he asks, would any or all of these options sound better than his Super Zeros for music listening? Is there one choice out of these that really stands out above the rest, again, particularly for music listening? Well, first of all, I always get a little <laughs> tick in my face when someone says mu music versus movies, because either the speaker's accurate or it's not. That's my opinion. So if it sounds good for movies, it ought to sound good for music, too. The I difference what being often two comes channels up is, versus five. Yeah, I think what often comes up is that upper bass uh, range, because there's yeah. a lot of content in music in that 500 hertz to 80 hertz range. Oh, yes. There's a lot in there. Uh, right. Whereas in movies, there's uh, typically a bit more separation. A lot right? more put dialogue in, in movies. A lot more dialogue, which is, I mean, the, the fundamental of a person's voice might be down in that range, but it's you're, what you often care about is the consonant sound so you can understand what they're saying and they're a much sure. higher frequency. Uh, you know, things like uh, bullet shots or, or other sound effects are often higher frequencies and then you have the subwoofer filling in the lowest yeah. stuff. So you don't always notice that 500 hertz 250 hertz range as much in movies i can see that and yeah. i can see why he might notice that more so well, certainly it, it makes sense that with nht super zeros in this size of room some of that 500 hertz to 80 hertz range could be sounding a little bit mm -hmm. lacking that's not surprising the three that he mentioned they're all pretty good choices now tom went uh you know he owns the various grand um speakers from aperion and they're very pretty those are they're pretty very, speakers they are very to pretty. me yeah, he has the bookshelves and he has commented that they're a little bit bass shy, right? Okay, if you're yeah, sitting yeah. close to them in a small room and those were the speakers you're using, really, really clear highs, really, really clear dialogue and mid-range and all of that, but a little bit bass shy. So the bookshelf speakers in the Varus Grand line, probably not the ones you want for this room. Right. I would say they're, they're an improvement over the NHT Super Zeros in the treble and the mid-range, but the thing you're most concerned about is that full-bodied 500 hertz sound. So probably not the best choice here. Between the... Uh, Ascend Sierra Ones, which are a bookshelf speaker, but a very capable bookshelf speaker, sure. and the EMP in t uh, Impression Series. That, to me, is, is almost a bit of a toss-up. Now, the Impression Series towers can certainly play louder out and out. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. They have person... a slightly higher sensitivity, and yeah, you and might get more of the fullness that you want. I'd lean toward the drivers. towers. Yeah, and, and if you want to hit like 120 decibel concert levels, Ooh. I would say get the MP Impression Series speakers because the CR1s won't be giving you that. And 17 by 22 is the room size. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd probably go for the bigger towers. But if... It's more a matter of you really care a lot about the treble, a lot about the detail and the clarity, then the Sierra 1 is a little bit more extended in the highs, a little bit better detail in the treble, and certainly not lacking in that upper bass range. It would be sufficient for this room size. But would so, it fix his fullness problem? Not as much as yeah. the MP Impression Series speakers would. So that's sort of the toss-up, right? Uh, have a sit down with yourself. <laughs> consider how much how loud you really like to play because if you're someone who's like i only ever want to hit like 90 decibels anyway then the sierra ones will easily give you that and then a little bit more detail in the treble i Whereas occasionally like, like to really rock my world there I you go. some movies are really in some concerts if i'm watching a live concert i want it to feel like a concert there you, you know? go so, you know, ha have a conversation with yourself and decide what it is that you want to do. And between those two, that should de should decide it for you. Now, for this, uh, we're, we're now reaching new things for this That's week right. at this point <laughs> in the show. I'm going to uh, read you the next thing, and then I'm going to uh, take that uh, aforementioned coffee okay. break. There you go. I coffee might break. I might continue on to the next question if necessary, Lee. Uh, we'll no, this won't take that long. Back. This is a quick <laughs> coffee break. Uh, uh, Jason S. is our next questioner. Uh has hopefully won the battle of the hum. Uh, mm -hmm. Good for you, because good Lord, that can drive you insane. I have some of that going oh, on now. Yes. <laughs> uh, it seems to have been two things for him. Uh, on the back of his Axiom EP500 subwoofer, there's a screw that can be tightened or loosened to adjust grounding. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, it's a tightening. ground lift screw that they have on the back of that EP500. So. Wow. He had it loose, but not loose enough. <laughs> this removed enough hum that it no longer scares the dog. <laughs> My dog's old and half deaf. He does not scared of anything. <laughs> a big Sikorsky-type dual-bladed helicopter flew over our house this morning, <laughs> and it set me straight up out of bed because it sounded like the world was coming to an mm -hmm. end, and I don't know why that military helicopter was flying low over our neighborhood, but it scared my dog 
didn't care. <laughs> anyway, uh, next, his two-channel amp is a recapped vintage Yamaha M80 with only a two-prong plug, but it has a grounding point on the back, mm-hmm. so he grounded it to his APC H15. That's uh, a, a, a surge protector, right? Yeah, yeah, with, uh, with voltage regulation. With voltage well, regulation. So. Yeah. Uh, this seems to have fixed the hum. Hey, there you go. So it was a grounding issue. We were questioning whether it was. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Everything grounded to the same point. It does work. Uh, so really, really glad you were able to solve that, Jason, because yes. it can be such a pain trying to track down where a hum is coming from. Tracking so, down noises like that. Like right now, I, I have two hums, my Yamaha amplifier hums, but not in its actual audio signal. You just mm-hmm. hear the power supply humming as you're standing next to the amp. Oh, sure, yeah. And even for some reason now, my mic processor is doing the same thing. You can hear (laughs) it humming, but the sound quality coming out of it is still good. Mm -hmm. So uh, hum will drive you insane. So kudos to Jason for solving that. It just feels so good to fix something. Uh, All is not well, though, unfortunately, uh, as he's still having dropout issues with his Oppo. Uh, It happens mostly with Blu-rays and SACDs. But, uh, and good for him for actually owning and playing some SACDs. Neat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it has happened occasionally with a regular CD. It happens at approximately an hourly interval. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, some experiments have revealed that removing his Roku 3 from the system seems to remove the dropout issue. I hope you have a few comments on this. Sure, yes. Uh, so, yeah, the Roku devices never turn off. Uh, they are always on. Um, they, they might go to a little screensaver thing if not used for long enough, but they are always on, which means that HDMI connection of theirs is always active. This does, unfortunately, seems to be seem to be an issue where, for whatever reason, approximately every hour, that Roku must be sending out a new handshake request to your AV receiver or your television to say, hey, you know, we're, we're still in communication here with each other. Um, so yeah, that, that seems to be what's going on there is that simply by having another device that's turned on, there's a moment where that handshake request goes across. It disrupts ever so slightly the, uh, the HDMI connection that's going between your OPPO and uh, your television or your AV receiver. I'm assuming it's an AV receiver if he's playing surround sound SACDs. So yeah, um, I, there isn't, unfortunately, a heck of a lot that can be done about this aside from... Uh, removing that Roku 3 from your system. Or, uh, you know, he was saying when he was just using one HDMI connection from the Oppo, he didn't seem to be having these issues. So since he's using two HDMI outputs, he's feeding one directly to the television and then just uh, the second HDMI output from the Oppo to his AV receiver as audio only. And he was getting some issues with that connection path. I wish I had a solution for you. Uh, This does just seem to be a handshaking error and uh, basically until you upgrade your AV receiver to something that can pass along the video signals to your television so that you can use just the one HDMI output, I don't know if we're going to be able to solve this for you. So uh, the solution, I guess, would be to use analog multi-channel connections from the Oppo if your AV receiver has such things. That would, of course, bypass this HDMI handshake issue. But uh, yeah, sorry, bit of bad news on that one. So <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed Rob's answer on that. I have I no know, idea what he just said. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I'm sure I got the type of helicopter wrong earlier. Okay. I, ju- I can just feel someone right now typing. That couldn't possibly be. Yeah, there's have been always someone much. who knows. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know Jack Squad. It was just a giant two rotor helicopter. But anyway, uh, <laughs> moving on to Jerry D now, yeah. right? All right. Mm-hmm. He has MKV backups of his HD DVDs made with Make MKV. Okay, and MKV is your typical sort of downloading from BitTorrent format. It's a container, so you can have any sort of audio or video codec codecs contained within it. It's just a container to to set it all together. And it's a sort of open source developed uh, format, right? Uh, He's been having playback stuttering using Plex on his Xbox One, PS4, PS3 via DLNA. Mm -hmm. And his Apple TV 4th Gen crashed just trying to open either (laughs) VLC or Plex. Uh, So he's trying to convert the MKVs to H.264 MP4s. Uh Uh, What settings should he use in Handbrake? That's a utility you use to do encoding. uh, So as not to lose any quality in the transcoding. Yeah, so uh, we talked to Jerry. We talked to Jerry during our hangout party last week, and we we went into this a little bit and sent me down a bit of a rabbit hole. Now, I'm not a regular Ah. Plex user, unfortunately, so I can't talk too much to Plex specifically on this issue, but I've got HD DVDs. I've 
got an HD DVD drive so I can rip those back them up to my computer. I can use M make MKV. Now I haven't used Handbrake in a while so this was good because the present version has some new or improved features over the last version uh, that I used it a while back. So this is good to, to educate me as well. So can I, I just went say ahead. at the outset, my, my instinct says there must be some way like his MKV could have H.264 encoding in it, right? It's possible, but yeah. HD DVDs were VC1. VC1, but it might have created an H.264 Well, MKV, no, because when, when you use Make MKV, it just takes whatever is in oh, the video okay. file and copies it. So All right, so it, it just okay. does it straight. So then it's I'm VC1. Wrong in it's not. It's a VC1. Okay. And uh, again, looking up stuff on forums and that, uh, lots of Plex users have been complaining about VC1 encoded video creating problems. Ah, uh, this okay. includes there are some Blu-rays that were encoded in VC1 as well. Mm -hmm. And those are giving people problems too. So it seems like VC1 is, is a little bit of a problem codec when it comes to Plex. Now, mm -hmm. I went ahead. I used Make MKV. I backed up a couple of HD DVDs. I went to play them in the Blu-ray player software that I still use, which is Total Media Theater. Now, the reason I'm still using Total Media Theater, which you can't even buy anymore, they've taken the program away completely, is it was the only software on PCs that would play back HD DVD discs natively. Oh, okay. So I put in the HD DVD. Total Media Theater played it just mm. fine. Okay. I backed it up to a Make MKV file, still VC1 inside of a Make MKV container. No changes made to the VC1, but Total Media Theater trying to play back that MKV container with VC1 in it was stuttering all over the place. How about that? Huh. I went into Windows Media Center because I'm still using Windows Center, uh, Windows 7 with Windows Media Center. I have Windows 7. I love it. So Speaking in Windows it. Media Center, I'm using the Shark 007 codec pack, which lets you decode all kinds of formats, which means it's just the Windows Media Player. That's all that's going on. The regular old Windows Media Player is what's right. happening, but with an extra codec pack on it. It played the MKV with VC1 just fine, all perfectly smooth. So huh. I knew that it wasn't the MKV that was the problem. I knew that it wasn't VC1 inherently that was a problem, but I got this it's stuttering right. playback in one playback format, and it's what everyone says happens in Plex when you're trying to playback VC1, is this stuttering. Right. So, now, is it the case that Plex has to transcode on the fly to feed it to these various players over the on, network? On some, it does. So, so, so I, it would have to. On the PS3, uh, it would have to, uh, yeah. if you were streaming it to your tablet or your phone, yeah. uh, to a Plex app on either of those, it would have to transcode it, uh, which might actually improve the situation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because... might, if it's on a fast enough computer doing That's the right. transcoding yeah. originally. But on the Xbox One, the Xbox One says in its Plex app that it can support VC1. Okay. So the Plex server that you're using is not going to transcode it to some other format because it says the xbox one can play this but he's getting it and it's doing exactly what my total media theater software was doing which is stuttering away while it tries mm. to do so now. so i did check out handbrake um i converted it to an mp4 using h.264 came out looking great came uh -huh. out playing just fine uh, so that does seem like it's a solution. It's time intensive. You got to transcode it, uh, yeah. but it, it worked. So Jerry, I'm hoping that it'll work for you too. Cause as far as I know, this, this did work. Uh, make MKV did make a, a fine backup to begin with. It does seem to be the playback software to blame. Yeah. I'm thinking so, every playback uh, software, every bit of hardware is going to be more likely to work smoothly with an H.264 encoded mp4 like. than that vc1 in it fact th like. this this sort of codec question and and file format question has come up in my world as i'm getting ready to digitize all of my old home videos assuming i can get my little matrox doohickey to work that i purchased to do that uh because it isn't working right now whole other issue but you know i want to end up with all my home videos uh both backed up onto dvds and also available on a home server where i can uh, upload them to YouTube, watch them on the TV in the living room via DLNA, that kind of thing, right? I want them there. And so the choice of codec is kind of a big deal because I don't ever want to do it again. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling because of the commonality now of H.264, that's probably the direction I want to go. It seems like everything can play that. Yeah, uh, it really seems to be the case. And um, so, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that's a good plan, Jerry. Now, Jerry was saying, what exact setting should he use in Handbrake to get the best quality? So first, I have to make the disclaimer. You're starting with the raw video, which is just RGB video, full fat, right? <laughs> it's being compressed 
originally using VC1 onto that HD DVD. It is a lossy compression. It's like right. compressing audio into a into an MP3. Now, if you use a really high quality MP3, it's not like it's going to sound significantly worse. That's right. If you're using really good video compression, it's not going to look significantly worse, but it is lossy. Some information was lost. Right. When you transcode it, what they're doing is they're decoding it. They're blowing it back up into full fat RGB. And then you're compressing it again, just in a different format. Sure. But that's very similar to having a, an MP3. Having a very good MP3. Converting then, it back to PCM, yeah. full fat audio, and then compressing it again right. a second time. So you are losing data both times. So in the strictest sense, there is no setting in Handbrake that will give you completely lossless video quality because you're going from a lossy format and then changing it into another lossy format right. so you're encoding it a second time. That's the strictest answer. However, if you basically just use the settings that they use on a Blu-ray, so they use the uh, H.264 high format because there's the low main high format. So they use the high format with level 4.1, which is all options you can choose in Handbrake. So if you choose the H.264 high format with level 4.1 and you give it somewhere in the range of 30,000 kilobits per second, 30 megabits per second. That's a lot of megabits. That ought to look pretty lot. darn good. I know um, there are Blu-rays that aren't even using that high of a bitrate. That's bit right, rate. yeah. And, and VC1 was using like 20 megabits per second to begin with. So, you know, um, basically Handbrake defaults to 20 megabits per second. That's sort of where it defaults to. Um, once in a while, you can pick up a little artifact if you yeah. leave it there. So I, I found if you bump that up to 30, uh, bump it up to 30,000 uh, kilobits per second, 30 megabits per second, uh, using those H.264 settings high and level 4.1, to my eye, it was indiscernible. Yeah, that ought to look so, beautiful. I mean, because yeah. I've seen beautiful downloaded videos with lower bit rate than that. Sure. And also, I guess it doesn't matter to even ask whether he's on wireless or wired with all these devices because he's talking Not about it across point. all these devices. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, it does give you the interesting thing of when you first back up the MKV of the original HD DVD, maybe it's uh, 15, 18 gigabytes. And then when you convert it to the H.264 with these settings, you end up with like 25, 26. So you actually made right. a larger file, even though you're compressing it a second time. Right. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of what it takes to make it imperceptibly loss lossy. So... Um, so that's what I would recommend. There you go. And a familiar name to us, yes. Infinite Gary. He needs his own intro, something with echo, <laughs> something with reverb. Infinite Gary. Uh, Gary found an article that describes the logistics and equipment used by the uh, Major League Baseball Network to broadcast live baseball games in 4K on DirecTV. Mm -hmm. Gary noticed one particular quote where they said, the fly in the ointment is we don't have a vendor who could deliver 4K replay in a compact or affordable way. So we concluded we could do live cameras in 4K, but all the replay is up converted to 4K. I do believe that happened back in the transition from NTSC up to high def. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. yeah. From standard uh, Gary to asks, high def. couldn't they just record live 4K feed onto a hard drive and replay the footage from that? <laughs> Apparently, there must be more to it. Mm -hmm. So could we discuss the process of how 4K needs to be recorded so that the entire broadcast can truly be in 4K? Uh, you know, my, my first instinct here is there just hasn't been time for anyone to develop these sort of standalone boxes they need to pop into a rack that can record and spit it back out with commands from a control unit. It has to be compatible with all the uh, control boards in the truck and it has to fit in the racks and it has to, you know, feed it in and out quickly. It just isn't, no one's put together the box yet. So, and it probably wouldn't use a hard drive at this point. It's probably going to use uh, SSDs and a RAID or something <laughs> along those lines. To, to make sure it's got the speed because it has to spit it out perfectly and quickly and 4k is a lot and they're doing it uncompressed too yeah yeah you're you're very much right about that it is just sort of the switching box uh that they need to have uh when they're shooting live 4k uh that is using six um sdi third generation sdi connections which is a professional <laughs> video uh connection yeah um so that they they have six of those coming out and then what they mention in the article itself is that the camera itself that they're using can shoot 4k at 60 frames per second or 1080p at um you know a high frame rate for slow motion like right. 240 frames right. per second but it can't do both it can't do 4k at the high frame rate 
So right. when they're talking about replay, they're, they're talking slow motion replay as That's well. That's right. right. Which yeah. means you have to shoot at a higher frame rate, which the cameras themselves can't do. Then they don't have the equipment to switch through all of it, which would probably require even more than the six SDI connections they're already using because you're talking about quadrupling yeah. the frame rate on top of all of it. <laughs> Just a giant wad of cables coming yeah. <laughs> into this box. It would be so, incredible. Because yeah, if you'll notice, even today with high definition, 1080p being a common thing nowadays, even mm -hmm. today, not every camera angle can be shown in super slow-mo at a, right. like an NFL game or a college football game yeah. or any sports game. So it, it's asking a lot to get full-on mm -hmm. replay slow-mo capability from yeah. every camera in 4K. It's not going to happen for a little yeah, while. Yeah, so it's, it's not just a matter of storing it. It's it's all the switching it on the fly and having having the footage to begin with. Um, so yeah, that, yeah that's band, what's going on. Bandwidth there. is a hell of a thing. <laughs> You do need a lot of it. Uh, Gary's video calibrator recommended that he use his new LG 4K OLED TV. I'm jealous. Mm -hmm. For at least 200 hours before doing a full calibration. Why? What's changing? And what is the aging process like for OLED TVs? Hmm. I know back in the uh, plasma days, mm -hmm. my plasma told me to be super duper careful about burn-in for the first couple hundred hours. Yeah. And do you think, Rob, that this 200-hour thing is being said about OLEDs because people are just treating it like a plasma? Or do the OLED manufacturers say to do this? No, I, I suspect it's more a matter of better safe than sorry advice right, uh, right. going on here. Because now, objectively, OLED displays do dim over time. Sure. Uh, they dim more slowly than plasmas used to. Yeah. They last longer than plasmas used to. Um, yeah. But they do dim over time. They, they, they don't retain the exact same light output over their entire useful life. So I, I, as far as I know, this is more a matter of just, just erring on the side of safety saying, okay, when it's perfectly brand new, that's of course the brightest it's ever going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, within the first couple hundred hours, if there's going to be some initial light loss, that's when it's likely to happen. So they're essentially just giving the same advice that they gave for plasmas. I don't know if it's genuinely necessary, yeah. uh, but it's kind of a, what does it hurt? <laughs> right. It doesn't hurt anything except you're, you know, unching for that calibration. Yeah, to get yeah. If, you're, perfect. if you're a little imp but impatient for it. I remember um, our, our plasma was purchased in 2005. And boy, back at the time, people would come to our house and watch anything absolutely anything and at the day everybody's like oh it's like 3d you know back in the day that and my plasma actually had it said in the owner's manual about that 200 hours yeah so like don't watch anything that's pillar boxed and don't watch anything with a lot of logos on it for the first yeah, yeah. and sure enough i recall there was a point it was some number of months after we got the tv i felt like i needed to bump up the brightness just a touch uh -huh. just a touch yeah. right and then there came a point some number of years later where I bumped it up significantly more. Mm -hmm. So that when I first started with my plasma, 11 years ago almost, uh, it, it, you know, it was like a plus one on the contrast, and then we went to about <laughs> a plus five, and now it's a plus 20. But sure. it stayed at plus 20 now for years. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's going to, it, it plateaued, and it's just chugging along, and, and we're trying to make it last until I can go steal Gary's OLED TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it seems as though OLEDs don't suffer from quite the same uh, rapid uh, right. light loss right at the beginning. It, it doesn't seem to be the case, but yeah, I think the calibrator is just erring on the side of safety. Do, do so. you think we're going to have all the BS about burn-in with OLEDs? Oh, it's already out there. You know, the LCD manufacturers are already saying it can happen, and it, technically it can't. But you know what? Image retention can happen on an LCD too. It's not sure. utterly impossible. So um, yeah, the... I'm right. I'm very not worried about it, but at the same time, if that's what your calibrator says to do, and it's 200 hours, you can kind of just leave it on for just leave the TV on. You're watching it or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're watching it constantly anyway. Yeah. Leave it on for two weeks, <laughs> it'll be fine. Yeah. But man, oh man, I went to Best Buy recently. My wife gave me way too much time in Best Buy because <laughs> we were there to look at new phones, really looking at that Samsung S7. Probably going to order those unlocked and and have a great time with it. But uh, yeah, I went and looked at TVs in Best Buy. And in our Best Buy, first of all, as an aside, uh, it, it used to be a Circuit City. And the area where they now have the TVs in our current Best Buy was where Circuit City used to have washing machines and stuff. Mm -hmm. And above it is a gigantic skylight uh, yes. right over all the best televisions. Sure. Of course, Makes sense, right? Yeah. And so everything's in torch mode. <laughs> but even still, that OLED really stood out. And yeah. I fell in love hard. And I'm like, that's my thing. Because in my room, I'm, uh, it's a 12 by 20 room. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking across the short side. So I'm only about nine feet from the screen, possibly even less, because the TV scooted away from the curtains sure. behind it. 
And uh, so we've got a wide viewing angle when people come over to look at a football game or something or to play games or whatnot. So I want that viewing angle. And man, the OLED, you can yep. stand all the way off to the side. And yes, you can. Perfect. And yep. I don't get the, the best. Uh, it, it looks to me like the 4K TVs that are LED TVs preserve a viewing angle pretty well. Yeah, but they, no comparison. No comparison not, not to that. No, no. The, the OLEDs are the top. Uh, you, you have to pay the premium for them right now. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, prices certainly have come down from since they were oh, brand yeah. new. So that will right, continue. Right. The, the one, they, they stopped selling 1080p OLEDs, apparently. Because for a brief while, there's, 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 still, there's still one out there that's... like uh, a curved one. Yeah. yeah I'm not right. buying a curved TV. No. <laughs> that's right. No and no. <laughs> What? Oh, Curve TV. I had a long conversation with a Best Buy employee. He was a fan of Curve TV and I wasn't. Mm. And it was like, I'm trying to have the most civil conversation. <laughs> no, you're in the right, Lee. <laughs> that, I, I know. And, and, and he, he's watching alone at home. And I'm like, that's why it looks good to you. You're in the one sweet spot where it looks okay. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Will T on Facebook. Will bought a Yamaha RX V777 AV receiver. Yay, Yamaha is what I have. Uh, less than a year ago. He's been very happy with it, but it doesn't do Atmos. He noticed that Accessories for Less is selling Marantz SR6010 for $899, but Will is thinking that if he buys a receiver just for Atmos, he'd like the option to go 7.2.4. Mm -hmm. Can the Marantz SR6010 do 7.2.4 somehow? If not, what are the least expensive models that can. Uh, am I correct that there are enough line level outputs to add on amps and do 724 or not? There are enough pre outs, but there are enough, uh, not enough processing channels built into that SR6010. The SR6010 tops out at nine speakers total. I you see. could do a 5.2.4, you could do a 7.2.2, but you mm -hmm. cannot do 7.2.4 with the SR6010. It tops out at nine speakers. Uh, so, right this moment, the least expensive models that can do the full 11 speaker setup, 7.2.4, uh, you're looking at the Denon AVR X6200W. Uh, the Marantz SR7010, or if you're looking at Yamaha, it would be the RXA3060 or RXA3050. So the RXA3050 okay. uh, and the Denon and Marantz that I just mentioned, they all go for about $1,500 on accessories That's a for less. big jump. It's a big dump. Yeah. So they're $1,400, $1,500. Right. Uh, so, you know, at five or $600 more than the $900 at Accessories for Less SR6010. So, yeah, it's a big jump. Now, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, well, go. I guess we can uh, go on to the, the next questions because it'll come up what I was about to say. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, he's been happy with Yamaha, but we seem to recommend Denim Rants more highly. Why is that? Yeah, so a few things. Well, first of all, if you heard us begging on Yamaha last week, uh, the whole silliness of having to press straight just to hear Atmos or DTSX, right? Uh, and never having the front panel display actually tell you that it's in Atmos or DTSX, right. that's just silliness and having to press straight every time to do that. A little bit of frustration. Uh, more than that, uh, we prefer Odyssey Multi EQ XT32 for the auto setup and room correction, uh, particularly in the deepest bass because why pow even the highest version of it stops at 32 hertz doesn't go all the way down to 20 hertz or lower that's true um and when it comes to atmos uh Denon and Marantz give you more setup flexibility you can have top middle speakers which is not a label that's available in the yamaha models they don't give you the option of calling anything top middle uh Denon and Marantz also give you the option of using front wide speakers if you would like to yamaha mm. doesn't give you that option uh so it's just a little bit more flexibility the uh setup wizard for Denon and Marantz is impressively good Gotcha. Uh, you usually don't get to say that about AV receivers, but they've done a darn good job on it. So until now, the killer feature for Yamaha has been music cast if you want to do whole house audio. But mm -hmm. now the newest uh, models coming out from Den and Amarantz include their version of whole house audio, which is called Heos. So it's all kind of coming up Den and Amarantz these days. Now, we have no particular affinity for Den and Amarantz just inherently. It's you're like just whoever, you're looking at features. Whoever puts out the best feature set at the best price points. Right, uh, right. That's Assuming who we're the recommend. sound quality is of course, indiscernible of course. between these three brand names. I understand where he's coming from. Like, I've just happened to be a fan of Yamaha since sure. I was a teenager. And I mean, it's not like the no. RXA3050 or 3060 is a bad choice by any means. If it does what everything you want it to do, they're great receivers. But, you know, that just to explain why we've recommended Den and right. Amarantz more highly, because we're talking to a broad audience right we want to hit the most people that we can if there's a specific instance where you're like i gotta have music cast i'm like it's not like you're getting a bad product and that's the right. color feature so and they tend to sound good you know as an aside because i'm king tangent 
Uh, <laughs> I, I did figure out a way to please myself with additional bass without having a subwoofer yet. Okay, okay. I did. You remember we talked about this oh, where yes. I got I got disappointed when I switched to a newer receiver that didn't have my old receiver's magic bass extension button. My old receiver from the year 2000 had a bass extension button because mm -hmm. back in the year 2000, not as many people had subwoofers, and it was a nice, happy way to get some more oomph. Well, uh, I, I did a manual tweaking of the YPAL settings. Yes. And yes. I looked at the YPAL settings, and uh, there are, I think it was seven, it's like a seven-band EQ, yeah, essentially. that's right, yeah. And at each equalization point, you pick the curve and the intensity of the mm -hmm. boost or cut. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that it was doubling up at some frequencies to create a more complex curve, I suppose. Sure. Like there, but one of my speakers was doubling up at like 8K uh, okay. frequency, putting yeah, yeah. a weird little curve. But the other one only had one bump up at that frequency. And mm -hmm. so one band was unused okay. on one side. Yep. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a hit on this side and just make it match the 8K bump on the other side. Sure. I know that won't be perfect. <laughs> and then I'm going to free up a band on each side and then use it down at 32 and a half hertz, which is sure. the lowest it'll go. Yep. And so I did that and just kind of frankly played with it Absolutely. until I found, because you had to be careful if you boosted the 32 and a half too much, you also boosted the one next to it yeah, that's right. and you made it too high. And so I found the right uh, shape of the curve sure. uh, and, and to, to it kind of looked and sounded. And you know what? That made a difference. That was kind of nice. That's an EQ. <laughs> I kind of invented the the base extension I was missing from my old amp until I can afford the subs I want. And, and I'm go. I'm very pleased. It's actually quite a nice little feel to it. So I kind of calmed down about that whole lack of base. Ah, uh, nice. Angry. Well, what do you know? EQ works. EQ actually does a real <laughs> thing. Yeah. How about that? You turn it up and it gets louder. Wow. <laughs> and it's pretty sharp. So that's just a nice little uh, happy success story there from me. Oh, uh, yay. So back back to the question at hand. Denon and Marantz recently announced new 7.2.4 Atmos receiver models. Should he wait for one of those? Can yeah, you stand so, to wait for one of those? <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting because uh, what Denon and Marantz have announced, uh, so we're talking about their new uh, SR6011 or SR7011 in the mm -hmm. Marantz lineup, uh, and the new Denon uh, AVR X4300 and X6300. Right, so obviously these are replacing the models that I, I mentioned previously. So what they have done is they have brought 11 speaker processing down in price to the 4300 model and the SR6011 model. So those have come down in price. Now they, they do an, an interesting sort of feature TikTok between Denon and Marantz. So the Marantz SR6011 is gonna be the least expensive. You're probably looking at about $1,200 there. So even mm. brand new uh, when it comes out, now it's not coming out till like October, November time frame so right. there's a wait period here uh, and of course you're not going to be able to get it as a refurbished unit from accessories for less right away at a right. discount um but even brand new it's probably going to be in the 1200 hundred dollar range now the sr6011 does not do heos so it doesn't have that feature and okay. it does not have the ability to be upgraded to oro 3d which do probably you doesn't matter to be no, you really don't <laughs> uh but it does do 11 speaker processing now okay then you go up about 200 dollars more than that and you get the denon avr x4300 the x4300 adds the ability to be upgraded to oro 3d that's an that's an additional 200 dollars upgrade on top of that because it's an again upgrade. Do you yeah need that? Uh, uh and it does add heos in the oh, x4300 okay. so that's really what you're paying for there but the 4300 does 11 speakers now then you go back over to the morant side the sr6 uh the sr7 7011, that's their flagship receiver on Marantz. Right. It does HEOS now, so they've added that in. It has more uh, power per channel, and it does 11 speaker processing. Then you go back over to the Denon X6300, and it actually has 11 amplifiers built in. Ah. All the all the other ones had nine amplifiers built into them. Ah, okay. So it's sort of a TikTok between uh, Denon and Marantz. They, they go up a little bit. Uh, but yeah, looking at that SR6011 that will be coming out October, November time frame, it's going to be less expensive than the, the receivers you could buy right now, even refurbished ones from accessories for less. Uh, so that is an option if you can wait until that time frame. Yeah, I, I love the idea of all the amps built into the receiver, although technically yeah. you could technically buy better amps yes. separately. Yep. I don't know how much difference it would make, but I don't know. So it, yep. it, you have to do some math. A little and, bit. And, yeah. and, and also some <laughs> psychology to determine how long you can stand to wait. 
That's what it comes down to. Uh, in order to justify buying a new receiver so soon after his current one, uh, Atmos would really have to be worth it. He heard a demo at a Magnolia store and thought it was very impressive. And some people comment that they love it, but other people uh, are the complete opposite and comment that they barely hear any difference and they totally don't think it's worth it. What mm. do we think? Should he go for it? Is the demo a good indication of what he'll really hear? And if it's done correctly, it should be. <laughs> Well, I'm going to assume that at some point in his life, he went from 5.1 to 7.1 and added those surround back speakers. Yeah. Right. Now, I could I address him directly. Will, are you the person who, when you went to 7.1 from 5.1 and added surround back speakers, said, I really like this. I really like that sometimes sound come from right behind me now. Yeah. Because if that's you, yeah. for some of us it is, then you will enjoy Atmos. Right. Okay? Now, there are other people who added surround back speakers, it's not that they couldn't hear anything back there at all, but they said, what's going on back there? I just don't care about. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. just not a big deal to me. And if Maybe that's it got you, a little more spacious, sure. you know, and that's all you could right. notice. And if that was you, then you probably won't care that much about Atmos. To me, right. it's a very similar situation where, you know, it, it's not like there's always stuff going over, on overhead. You right. wouldn't really want there to be, right? So there's the occasional sound effect up there. Sometimes the soundtrack is put up there. And it, it, it does definitely depend movie to movie. Of course. It depends on how it was mixed. So it's I was just like, thinking, if you're really into, say, action movies, yeah. you know. Uh, no, but it, even then, like, you know, like uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, well, was right. in Atmos. They barely used it. Like, there's, there's oh, almost right. nothing going on over there. Whereas John Wick makes fantastic use of the overhead speakers. Right. And, and it really enhances and adds something. Okay. But some people are just not going to take notice of that. Or if they do, they're not going to care. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I would put it to you in that, in that frame of reference of if you enjoy what surround back speakers do to enhance 5.1, then you'll enjoy Atmos. And I think it will be worth it to you. So I can't say exactly what he'll think of it but if he heard it a magnolia and was impressed by it then probably, he's probably the person yeah probably that's yeah. for you i i wish i could do it one day my room is such that there's nowhere to put rear speakers right. i mean there's there's a curtain and windows behind sure. my head yeah. and so i'm always stuck with 5.1 until i build a house one day maybe <laughs> i there's just nothing i could do I, I guess i could get speakers in the ceiling you know right uh, but I don't know if I want to go through the trouble. Uh, <laughs> he, he wants to buy a setup disc to adjust his audio and video settings. Sounds like a good idea. He's seen the Disney Wow disc, highly recommended. Is that a good choice? And is there a better choice? So I think it is a good choice. Yeah. I really yeah, yeah. like recommending it to, uh, particularly to people who aren't like super techie, because they right. do. What I like most about it is they walk you through the process. Right? Yeah. They don't just hand you a bunch of test patterns and say, well, you better know how to use these yourself. Right. It's like, no, they actually walk you through, pro through the process and they do it well. So I do like that Disney Wow disc. Now, if you're a person who's super technical and you already have your own light meter and you already know how to use CalMan from SpectraCal and all that, and yeah, all, you want, yeah. all you want are the most advanced test patterns, then there's the Spears and Munsell HD benchmark disc, yeah. which has more advanced test patterns than what Disney Wow gives you, but it doesn't walk you through the process at all. It's meant for professionals, right? So I right. will say that Spears and Munsell disc is out there if that's you you're more the professional user but if you're not and you want something that will actually instruct you how to use the patterns on the disc as you go then I absolutely love that Disney Wow disc I think I it's mean it's definitely going to get you most of the way there Oh, yeah. And I mean, again, we have to specify this is a setup disc. It's not a full calibration. You're not right. measuring something with a meter. You're not making adjustments in the service menu. But as far as going through the user level controls that you can access using your right. remote control, it does a very nice job with that. So, right, right. Yeah. If the setup disc has audio tests and setup instructions, should he use them? Should he still use YPOW or Odyssey in the future? Should he forego auto setup in favor of the disc? Can he use both? If he uses both, which one should he run first? Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, the way I would come at it is I would use your auto setup. Yes. Right. As normal. Yeah. I would do what our uh, advice is, which is after you've run the auto setup, check the settings, make sure that all the speakers are set to small, even if the auto setup sets some of them to large. Absolutely. Change that all to small. If you have crossovers set for the speakers and some of them are below 80 hertz, I would manually increase that to 80 hertz. If, you, if the auto setup set it to above 80 hertz, 90, 100, 110, whatever it might be, I would probably leave that alone. Yes. But if it sets something to a 40 hertz or a 60 hertz crossover, something like that, manually bump that up to 80 hertz. Mm -hmm. Now you're pretty much done. 
right? Now what I would use the audio tests on the Disney Wow disc, because it does have audio test patterns as well. I would just use that as confirmation. Or possibly just personal preference, like I did with my settings. Sure, yeah. If you just, just like the right. sound of some additional change, but always start with your Y Power Odyssey's settings. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wouldn't use what's on the disc in place of the auto setup. I wouldn't use it before the auto setup because there's no point making manual adjustments before you run the auto setup because the auto setup is just going to override it after you yeah. do. So run the auto setup first, do the manual adjustments that we recommend here on AV Rant. Then by all means, run through the audio tests and just do your confirmation or tune to taste. That's yeah, how I, I did have to tell Wipow on my Yamaha receiver that my rear speakers were small. It yep. thought they were large, and I was surprised at that. They, they have 8-inch woofers. They're three-way 8-inch bookshelf speakers. And if but, they're close to a wall or something, there might be some, yeah. some base reinforcements. So. Right, right. All right. Uh, Tom mentioned the following questions last week. This yeah. is Eric S. on YouTube. Yes, and I just want to put this out there. Like, Obviously, we, we have... We, we love that people are commenting on our YouTube videos. I just, I never read YouTube comments. I just, yeah. I, that part of the screen does not exist to me. Right. I do not read YouTube comments. I know, what's the point? Uh, but so, so a question at avrant.com. Yes, please please send your questions to us. Uh, the best, most efficient address. way. Yeah, so we're not we're not actively trying to leave anybody out, but but please don't make YouTube your primary way of sending us a question. It will not be seen. <laughs> or not for a while, anyway. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Eric upgraded his previous Sony AV receiver to a Sony STR DN 1060. It allows you to use front height speakers instead of surround back speakers and offers a feature called center channel lift that puts some of the center channel sound into the front height speakers to compensate for a center speaker that's positioned below the display. Uh, can we talk about the importance of matching the center and front height speakers for this effect? So I, I, had a heck of a time finding a, a, a regular manual to read about this uh, DN 1060 from Sony. They got some weird things as far as their manuals go. Um, so this is an interesting AV receiver. It, it does not have Dolby Pro Logic 2Z. It hmm. does not have DTS Neo X. It has their own front height algorithm. Sony's not... front height. Yeah. Uh, sound yes and and they don't call them front height speakers they call them front high speakers because, <laughs> you know because yeah. you have to be to notice yeah, the difference. It's, it's not officially front <laughs> height speakers from anyone else's program so it's a little bit odd in that way and they do have this uh center channel lift which seems to be the only use of the front high speakers huh. that i could i, I guess really? they have their i guess they have their own like cinema listening modes that might Probably throw something does. in there. But it, like I say, it doesn't have the standard ones we would expect, like Dolby Pro Logic 2Z, which is by far the most common. It doesn't have that. Um, so, I mean, if, if what you're using this for is this center channel lift, which is a little bit questionable in how well yeah. it works because our ears are not positioned low and high. We don't right. do a great job of triangulating sound vertically. Right. Um, but I do lay over on the couch a lot. Sure. There's that. that where if you tilt your head to the side, that <laughs> yeah. would work. Um, like literally, I watch so many movies just hanging over on the armrest, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so maybe uh, sometimes I have one ear covered like I, you know, sure, falling yeah. asleep. So, so I, it, it's not completely useless. And, and yeah. this can this can subtly work. Um, you know, as far as matching your front high speakers to your, your center channel speaker or, or your front left and right speakers for that matter. I mean, of course it would benefit to have a timbre match, especially when they're all playing the same thing. Because if you have yeah. a significant timbre mismatch, uh, then you're going to be able to hear that. It's going to sound like two yeah. different sound sources. It's I not feel like, yeah, it's together. already going to sort of schmoo the sound, make it yeah. more diffuse. And also, if your speakers are up high, then you've kind of got the ceiling to contend with with reflections, That's right. too. Yeah, and, so and it, just by having them in that odd position of high on the wall, close to the ceiling, it's going to be difficult to get a good timbre match regardless. Like, even if you put yeah. literally identical speakers there, they're going to sound different because they're in close proximity to the ceiling and high up on the wall and aiming down at you. So uh, I think what's what this is about is we frequently say, like, if you're going to skimp somewhere, skimp on your surround speakers, skimp on your height speakers, skimp on your overhead speakers, because it's less important for those to tamper match really really closely to the right. rest of your system because they're typically mostly playing ambience in this situation where they're going to be replicating what's coming out of your center speaker and the whole idea is for it to sound uniform and trick your brain into think the sound is coming from some point in between the two right. then yeah it is going to be important to have a timbre match there it's probably best to use the exact same speakers that you're using yeah. uh for that center channel speaker that that's as close as you're going to get as far as what's coming out of the speaker itself then you have to 
contend with them being in a different position. But, but... Uh, uh, unless you have an enormous screen or your center yeah. channel is far <laughs> below the screen, I just don't understand even the point, really, because your brain yeah. compensates for the the positioning. You, it, I've never it sat around where, where thinking... your eyes are looking. Your brain tends yeah. to go, well, that's where the sound came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it just yeah. Uh, to me, this seems dubious. Uh, I've, he's yeah. <laughs> he, he's hoping that by using front height speakers instead of surround back speakers, he's hoping, he will get something out of Atmos DTS-X or other advanced sound mixes. Will he? No. 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 Um, I mean, <laughs> nope. you can have Sony's own processing, but that would be just as effective on a standard 5.1 mix. Right. Um, because all it is doing, it is taking the standard mix that's 5.1 or 7.1, applying Sony's own processing to it and throwing some sounds up into those front high speakers. Right. So it's sort of high, guessing high. what's supposed to be there. Those aren't is, real yeah. separate channels. Those aren't. And, and if it's an Atmos mix, it completely d ignores the metadata that says this is an Atmos mix. It has no idea it's an Atmos mix. It thinks it's a 7.1 Dolby True HD mix. Uh, if yeah. it's DTS-X, it completely ignores the metadata. It has no idea it's DTS-X. It thinks it's DTS-HD Master Audio. Right. Um, if it's one of the other formats, like this is going to come up, like a DTS-Neo-X mix, it has no idea that it's no a DTS-Neo-X no. mix. It just thinks it's... You know, I, I think audio, so. even you and I on one of these podcasts where I've joined you uh, have talked about front heights in some way. I remember saying yeah. something along the lines of, if you have some speakers sitting around, try yeah. it. Sure. You're not going to always turn them off. Do you, you like it? Great. But yeah. I wouldn't make this a central part of my purchases or setup. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't. Make, uh, he is a fan of 3D. And while he was searching for 3D content, he noticed that the movie step up revolution is in I've 3d and yeah you know about this oh, yeah. uh, it, it's in 3d and dts x 11.1 uh, is he getting anything special out of that soundtrack with his front height speakers no so very important it is not in dts x 11.1 it is in dts neo x there you go which was which is a different thing. An upmixing format, right? So it, it's very confusing because you have DTS-X, which is the full object-based audio. Comes right. with metadata. You have to have the decoder. If you do have the decoder, then it renders these audio objects to put them in precise locations in 3D space. Hmm. Then they have DTS Neural X. Okay, DTS Neural Neural, X. as in your neural network, your neurons. <laughs> Which is their current highest end upmixing that takes your regular 5.1 or 7.1 content and upmixes it to make use of overhead speakers, the type you that you would have for DTS X. And then there was the older version, DTS Neo X which is what this is on this hmm. Step Up Revolution desk, DTS Neo X, which is 7.1, but it's kind of like the way Dolby Pro Logic 2 was, where uh -huh. you could kind of matrix in other sounds to a go. smaller channel count. So this could add front wide speakers and front height speakers. Right? If it was thus encoded. Yeah, I see how that works. Yeah. Okay. But you had to have the decoder. You had to have the DTS yeah. Neo X decoder and this Sony does not. No, so it doesn't. So once again, this the Sony that you have, it has no idea that it's DTS Neo X on the disc. It just thinks it's uh, DTS HD Master Audio in 7.1. Right, just because you can add more speakers to your receiver yeah. doesn't mean your receiver knows what to put in those speakers based yeah. on and what's it's, on it's, that disc. It's just using its own Sony algorithm to put some sounds into the front heights so. right uh, the reason he didn't buy a receiver that says it supports Atmos and DTS X is because he was only considering receivers that cost less than $500 I understand that yes and any such models were limited to a maximum of seven speakers 5.1.2 mm -hmm. he's thinking his thinking is that uh, Atmos really needs four overhead speakers so 5.1.4 uh, also AKA at least nine speakers minimum. Yeah, okay, yeah. 5.1.4, nine speakers minimum. How are manufacturers allowed to put an Atmos or <laughs> DTSX sticker on a 7.1 receiver? How Be dare they? Because you could have 5.1 with two overhead speakers. Yeah. Uh, that is something that the renderer knows how to render to. Uh, that might be fact, something I might do in the future. You know, like I just said, I'll yeah. never have a space yeah, for yeah. rear speakers. So I could see 5.2.2. <laughs> Yeah, but ultimately, I'm fun. in agreement with Eric. I, I, yeah. I, I personally think you do need nine speakers minimum yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to really, because what you're trying to do is create a dome of sound, yes. right? And if you imagine, how do you create a dome with just five speakers around you and two overhead? You, you can kind of create a triangle. Yeah, you create a TP right? at that like point. A you're, you're pyramid a of, <laughs> you know, a triangular shape thing, but not really a nice curved dome. Whereas right. if you have four overhead speakers, you can get more of a dome shape going over yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And it makes more sense. So I, I'm in agreement. Um, you know, so I mean, it is, it's, 
It's the By the way, I like how you say dome. Yes. It's like Carl Sagan pronouncing billions and billions. (laughs) Dome. (laughs) But um, (laughs) it's about being able to steer sounds around you. So even if you only have seven speakers, and we should keep in mind, even if you have a traditional seven speaker setup that has uh, surround backs, no speakers overhead, just your regular surrounds and your surround backs, that is still uh, what they would call like an at most capable speaker setup in that the renderer can start to steer sounds around you as mm-hmm. long as it has seven speakers to work with. I it's see. just the steering of that sound won't be as precise. Right. It won't, it, it will create this, you know, sort of the sound was here and now it's here rather than a smooth transition mm-hmm. of the sound, right? So, right. I mean, they're allowed to because the renderer can do it. Uh, yeah. Even if you had no overhead speakers and only hits around backs, the renderer can do it. Uh, so, of course, they're allowed to. But yeah, the experience will be best with at least yeah, nine speakers. My instinct is make the jump to the full, you know, I agree. four yeah. overhead. I, I agree. And thankfully, you. the prices are starting to come down a little bit. So Eventually, I will get there uh, one day, maybe, if I can <laughs> build a new house. Uh, uh, Josh A. is our next uh, questioner. Mm-hmm. He has a quad sub setup with a pair of Velodyne Optimum 12s and a pair of Rhythmic F15 HPs. He's thinking about ditching the Velodynes in favor of a pair of Rhythmic F25s or SVS PB13 Ultras or PC13 Ultras. Would the SVSs match well with the F15 HPs? Or would he be better off with the F25s, which would keep the whole (laughs) system both sealed and rhythmic? His room is 13 by 18 by 8, and he uses... (laughs) R-E-W, and a mini DSP 2x4 to equalize. My goodness, you have plenty of bass power in that 13x18 room. I was 13x18x8. Wow, by eight. This wow. is crazy overkill. Crazy, wow, seriously. Crazy overkill. Have you, how, how you haven't cracked a rib with bass, I'll, I don't understand. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> it must really just be... I, I don't so eat before you go in there. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what he is chasing um liquefying his liver i don't know I, what are you gonna do you're gonna burn your i i don't know so i, I mean going back plasters to those Velodyne, coming off the walls those velodyne optimum 12s and and it is true the 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 uh, the rhythmic subs that he already has the f15 hps those are the sealed version so 15 inch driver the high yeah. power amp which is 600 watts in a sealed container because there's a an fv15 hp and the v stands for vented so yeah. that's that's the one that has the port in it so he's got the sealed ones but they can play louder and lower than his optimum 12s so yeah. There's a little bit of something there, which is if you want four subs that all have the same capability of, of, of loudness and lowness that they can play, then okay, you have a little bit of room to improve here. However, 13 by 18 by 8, in that room size, the optimal 12s it. are getting you down to 20 hertz. They're yeah. playing as loud as you could want them to. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe he's, he's playing those test patterns that go down to 10 hertz and he just wants to pressurize that at like 120 yeah. dB. I mean, okay, if, if, that's, if that's what you want to do, I'm okay yeah, with that. If you, that's you can the do game, what you want to do. <laughs> do it. Yeah, I mean, why not? Life is short. Uh, rattle your windows. So uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why two more F15 HPs are not even a consideration. I know, that's what, what makes sense to me completely just, different i mean the f25s are just a dual driver version of the f15 so it's an 800 watt amplifier but two 15 inch drivers in a sealed enclosure wow so there must be something that he's chasing after here yeah it's called a unicorn he's chasing a purple <laughs> dragon it's uh dude where it's are you going with this unnecessary i mean there's there's no way i would be recommending I th- I he... this to someone who was asking just <laughs> offhand what subwoofer should i buy the, for this room size there's no chance yeah I, um, I think he's already to the point where you could just about cover any reasonably recorded sound that is going to appear yeah. on a movie or so... anything i mean you're you're up to experimental <laughs> level audio here <laughs> <laughs> so i mean the 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 uh svs the pb13 ultra or the pc13 ultra both of those can be sealed they, they come with three port plugs mm-hmm. and a switch on the DSP amplifier to put them into sealed mode. And if you did so, they're really quite equivalent with that F15 HP, which mm-hmm. is always sealed, of course. That's right. just the cabinet. If you put them into the sealed mode, they, they really are quite equivalent. Even though they're a slightly smaller driver, they have a, a more powerful amplifier. So that kind of comp, you know compensates a little bit for what's going on there. Um, so, I mean, those would be a great match. Uh, and then if you went to a larger room and then you unsealed them, they can play louder than the F15 HPs when they're in their ported mode. So that gives you that 
amount of flexibility. Then the F-25s, of course, are, uh, are even louder than the PB-13 Ultra in its sealed mode, and it's mm. approaching how loud it can get even in ported mode. So, uh, but of course, they're the most expensive choice as well. Sure. So uh, I would say no matter what you get here, they are certainly going to crush your room. Uh, yeah. Any of them are overkill for that. Uh, you can't really go too wrong. So I, there's not a particular reason to get the F25 HP over the PB or PC13 Ultra. If you get the PB or PC13 Ultra, you have the option of sealing them or opening up, them up and porting them. So from that point of view, they're probably a little bit more flexible. Yeah, that, that's yeah. about all I can say. I, Is I he ever moving to another room that's, with this stuff? Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I that kind would of hope change. so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> anyway, that's that's about the best answer I can give you there. So. I mean, have fun, but don't don't overthink it. Yeah, you're already getting an amazing amount of bass in the room. <laughs> you are filling the room. Uh, oh, yeah. Next questioner, Jonathan F. sent us the description for the Murphy Corner Line Array uh, speaker that yeah. uses 24 three and a half inch quote full range drivers yeah. in an eight foot floor to ceiling enclosure that is specifically shaped to go in the corner of a room. Mm -hmm. By having this standardized placement, I'm not so convinced that's a standardized placement, well, the variation... In the corner, in the front corners. The variation in sound from room to room is meant to be reduced, and with no crossover and using EQ, uh, frequency response throughout the entire room is meant to be more uniform and free from room modes. What do we think about this design? So it's really important to know what he was designing this speaker for, which was sound reinforcement for live playback of his band. Mm -hmm. And in that context, this makes more sense. Line arrays are fantastic in concert venues because they do give far more even dispersion across a wide uh, listening area. Right. That's, that's, their, that's their strength. Um, now, this whole corner placement, okay, I mean, what that allows him to do is predict what the bass response is going to be like. Because they're like, no, you know, every time I put this in a corner, I'm getting the same reflections from two corners, the ceiling, and the floor. I know that's sure. what it's going to be. I'm not dealing with variable distances from the side and back walls. So that's fine. Okay. So, I mean, what he's saying about being able to better predict what the uniformity of the bass is going to be from the speaker. That is true. Having a uh, larger listening area where the sound will be more uniform. That is also true. It's just, this isn't what you put it in a home theater or a music listening system, because what happens to your imaging, right? Right. Your imaging when something is in the left speaker is going to be way over in your front left corner. You're not going to get away from that. Right. Right. So this isn't what you would use to, because what if your room is 20 feet wide? Right. It could be. What if your room was 20 feet wide? Yeah. Well, now your front left and right speakers are 20 feet apart in the two front left, <laughs> left and right corners. So that doesn't right. make sense from an imaging point of view. But if, if what you're trying to do is reinforce the sound from your live band for a large audience, then yeah, that totally makes sense. Sure, sure. That's that, what I think that, of it. <laughs> it just doesn't. Uh, also, I'm suspicious of a website that looks like that. That's just, I know that's that's ah, he's, you know, throwing it out there. So. <laughs> yeah, just kind of, it's yeah. Anyway, no, I'm not into it. I'm not it. Yeah. I'm, I'm very sort of Tom skeptical on stuff like this. It looks a little nuts. It just looks well, yeah, little I nuts. mean, it's it's not what we're normally dealing with. I wouldn't put it in a home theater. Definitely right. not. Nah, but, I just you know, for for live concert, sure, that's reasonable. Boy, that's and plus, doesn't the fellow say that it's just stuff he's ordering from Parts Express? It is, yep. Yeah, it's yeah. Parts from Parts Express. You, you can build good stuff from Parts Express, but that's, sure can. I'm sorry, it's just weird. That's just all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, Monus on it's Twitter. Moani, Moani, that always trips people up. Okay, but Monus was funny too. Uh, Moanis, oh. sorry, Moanis, uh, uh, on Twitter, uh, first mentioned that he received his Ascend speakers that he purchased during their Memorial Day sale, and he likes them, so he says thanks. Yay! You're welcome. I'm uh, glad you like them. Yay. Uh, second, <laughs> he found a good deal on an open box LG EF9500 OLED. Mm -hmm. I'm jealous of uh, Moana's too. Uh, this is last year's model, and it's still more expensive than a brand new Vizio P series. So which one should he buy? Yeah. So, I mean, the only thing that's going on here is the EF9500 is from last year, yeah. and it does not have Dolby Vision. It does right. have HDR10, just it doesn't have Dolby Vision. Right. Um, so how important is it to you that you have Dolby Vision. Now, I would prefer to have Dolby Vision. It's not like Moani wouldn't like to have it if the right. price were more affordable. It but depends. Like, like, how long do you want to wait to have Dolby Vision? Yeah. Uh, how much do you want to spend? How much of a jump are you making? Like, you know, for me, going from an 11-year-old plasma to an OLED that didn't have Dolby Vision, oh, which yes. be amazeballs. Yeah. 
So, I mean, the, this OLED, this EF9500, in basically all other respects, is still the superior TV to the mm -hmm. Vizio P series. It has deeper black levels, better contrast, wider viewing angles, and it does support HDR10. So there's plenty of HDR TVs out there that that's what they do. There's mm -hmm. plenty of non Dolby Vision TVs. Um, and of course, the Vizio P series, uh, which does support Dolby Vision, uh, does not have the Amazon app on it because they don't support it on their SmartCast things. So that's one service you'd have have on the LG that you wouldn't have on the Vizio P series, except you wouldn't have the Dolby Vision version of it. So that's really the only question. Uh, but between the two, I would take the OLED if, if I mean, uh -huh. the majority of the content I watch is not going to be Dolby Vision anyway. I still have a tremendous number of Blu-rays. None of them are Dolby Vision. Yeah, no kidding. I'm still watching cable television on yeah. the thing. Yeah. So, so and plus, my God, uh, that LG OLED. I, I used to have a thing against really LG a long time ago, way <laughs> back in the day, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, LG TVs just look crummy to me. And so I got it in my head a long time ago that LG was just kind of one of those meh, lower end. Yeah, well, honestly, brand. their LCDs still aren't really any yeah. great heck. So, <laughs> but that OLED. Yes. Holy yes. cow. It is, it is the best. So, it's compelling. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Nick B. Mm -hmm. Nick B sends diagrams, which I will load and look at now. I did look at his diagrams <laughs> earlier. It's loading very slowly. We've, we've, he, we've viewed them before. Um, right. So he sent uh, pseudo the video blueprints. Familiar. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I've heard you guys describing this room. And so finally I get to see this sort of, yeah. Uh, did we determine whether his heavy gray lines meant like a beam coming down or as a wall? Oh, those are beams across the ceiling there. Those are beams so, across the so ceiling. Those so are it's... beams across the ceiling that oh. are holding up the rest of his house. Uh, and he's indicated where the support poles are that are holding up those gray beams. Right. So yeah, what we're looking at here is, um, if you're seeing the YouTube video, he's, he's redone his plan uh, where he's going to build two walls so that he can have a rectangular theater. Uh, it means a smaller room. So the room is uh, a little over 12 feet wide now and a little over 18 feet long. And he does want to have two rows of seats, but he's really trying to nail down all these plans so that he can, you know, build it to the way that he wants it, which is so perfect. Just to be clear to for people that are audio only, That's you know, right. he's looking at a, a typical complicated shape basement situation. Yeah, yeah. And he's trying to figure out the best arrangement and where to build some walls to make a nice, neat home theater. Yeah, that's right. Right. So uh, he's, yeah, and he's, he's conveniently put... Uh, foot markers and he's drawn Absolutely. a very nice little yeah it's, nice it's little diagram. clear it's clear to read so we appreciate that right so he's been looking over options for a dedicated theater room in his finished basement mm -hmm. uh which currently looks like the first figure he sent us he likes the idea of putting up two walls to get a more rectangular space yeah. as opposed to a slightly sort of l-shaped irregular thing with so stairs in the back we're good with that we're yeah. going along with that sounds fine he's pretty much decided on sitting one screen width the way from a 115 inch 16 by nine screen for simulating IMAX and watching 2.35 to one movies and for more casual viewing using zoom and magnetic masking panels from Seymour AV for a smaller screen. Okay. Uh, he wants to focus on getting everything perfect in the first row and the second row can bite it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, last, last week he was saying that, uh, he was thinking of doing the thing I often suggest, which is if you really like to watch movies in a really, really big image, uh, sit in your front row. And then for stuff like HDTV or video games or something where you might want a little bit a smaller angle of view, yeah. you know, just go sit yourself in the back row. He says, but if I'm going to do that, then he personally really cares that the audio is optimized for both rows. Right. Which in a room this small is more difficult to do. It's going to be tough. Right. So then he's saying, all right, you know what? Let's just forget about that back row. I mean, it's still nice to have there as additional seating. Right. Let's right. forget about that a little bit and we'll go back to the magnetic masking panel so that he can, he will always sit in the front row now. So he says, if we, if we take that as the setup that he will always sit in that front row, now can he nail down his plans? Yeah. So there's something to be said for working that sort of butt print into that one seat. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> it's just yours and it's perfectly comfortable. Uh, he originally wanted to go with an acoustically transparent screen, but after checking around, there doesn't seem to be a good option that allows for a close viewing distance. Mm. Interesting. So I was not personally aware of they have holes in it. them, right? They have holes in go. them. And if you get too close, you start to see the holes. <laughs> right. However, also when you get close, then as the speaker gets down to the bottom of the screen, you can start to tell that it's not in the center. Uh, the Seymour Center Stage XD recommends a minimum distance of 11 feet. Right. Uh, looking to the future, he'll likely buy something like an Epson LS10,000 in a few years when prices have come down. But an 11-foot viewing distance would be a 150-inch screen, which is near <laughs> the limit 
that's big, uh, which is near the limit for HDR brightness for the Epson. Do we know of any quality, acoustically transparent screens that work for short viewing distances? Right. So right over at Seymour AV, uh, and I mean, the reason we recommend Seymour AV for this screen is, first of all, they do acoustically transparent screens. Right. And second, they're the ones who have those manual magnetic masking panels instead mm -hmm. of the motorized magnet uh, masking panels, which are very expensive. Uh, they give you manual panels that you slap up there using yeah. magnets. So he's not so, far away. It's not hard to stand up and just that's right. <laughs> and then sit back down there. in your butt print. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um now, so Seymour so does have a screen material they call Center Stage UF, which is, stands for Ultra Fine, mm -hmm. right? Which is a tighter weave, smaller holes. You can sit as close as, I think they said, like eight feet to it, or, uh, uh, or it might have even been six feet or something like that, but closer anyway, which is sufficient for what he wants to do. Now, he, in his email, brought up the fact that it has a lower gain. Right. So instead uh -huh. of being a 1.1 gain like the center stage uh, XD fabric is, this is now a 0 0.8 gain. Um, mm. So it's it's losing a bit of the ref, uh, how much light it reflects. And he's like, well, he wants HDR. So now he's losing a bit of light from this lower gain screen. Does that mean he need an even brighter projector? Right. So he's trying to weigh right, the pluses right. and minuses. He also looked up the measurements and the ultra fine weave, which of course does have smaller holes and a tighter weave. It does attenuate the sound a little bit more. Hmm. So he's concerned of, uh, you know, losing some sound quality basically right, if he right. goes to that. Right. So he's got these concerns about it. Um, and then on top of that, he was mentioning that, um, he's a little bit concerned like we suggested putting his front left and right speakers behind the screen as well because the viewing angle is wide enough that that's really where they should be sure he's like but what happens when i put the masking panels in front of them right because why would you that's going to be where they are well when he puts up the masking panels they're going to be on the left and right sides of the screen mm -hmm. so if the left and right speakers are directly behind them won't the masking panels block the sound yeah. from the front left and right speakers if they're behind the screen well yeah uh you don't gotcha. have to worry about the masking panel thing because you can get acoustically transparent masking panels from Seymour AV. <laughs> now, but I, I, it feels like if you, you know, when they say acoustically transparent screen and acoustically transparent masking panels, they are mm -hmm. perfectly acoustically transparent. Well, honestly, the, the masking panels are basically speaker grill cloth. I got so okay. they, they are pretty darn right. acoustically right. transparent. All right. For the other side of it, which is just attenuating the sound a little bit more because of the smaller holes, well, you can compensate for that sure with just a little bit of EQ. Yeah, I mean, so, wouldn't your Odyssey or Wipow or anything? It sure would. Yeah, particularly it? Odyssey, right? Yeah. Odyssey would, and he's going for a full seven point two or seven point four point four setup. So yeah. I'm assuming he's going to have Odyssey Multi QXT XT32. It does. Nice. It does a good job, and we're talking about like two decibels of attenuation versus less than one decibel of attenuation with the XD. Yeah, you can so, so easily compensate for that. So that's not really a concern, and then on the lower gain with the 0.8 gain instead of the 1.1 gain, well, worked it out. He's talking about a 115-inch diagonal screen at the largest, right? 115-inch diagonal, yeah. yeah. So it's not huge, huge. Right? No, it's going to be big sitting, you know, that far away. It's going to be nice. I think he wants, like, a almost IMAX experience. Yeah, I so, I mean, th this is basically his next question, so I'll just roll into it. Uh, yeah, you know, he's on. asking, how do you calculate how much light you need for HDR? Well, with projectors, all you actually need is 100 nits. That's, that's where digital cinemas that are Dolby cinemas with Dolby Vision at the actual cinema that you go to, they top out at 100 nits. That's how oh. bright they get. And where standard dynamic range is supposed to top out is 50 nits or, or approximately 15 foot Lamberts, right? Because sure. in projectors, we often talk about foot Lamberts, yes. which is a different way of saying nits. So to convert between the two, uh, 15 foot Lamberts is about 50 nits. 30 foot Lamberts is about 100 nits. So what happens so, to your thousand nits uh, in HDR? In it all gets tone mapped down. It all gets tone mapped down. So this isn't a tremendous problem, right? So he was asking, how do you calculate it exactly? Well, you take the, the square feet of your screen. So, you know, it's 115 inches diagonal. You can work out how many inches tall, work out how many inches wide. Uh, Pythagoras, put that, yeah. put that in Put that in feet, all right? Yeah. So you work out uh, the square feet. So in his case, right, 115 inch diagonal screen is about 39 
0.25 square feet. That's the total surface area. That's big. That's so nice. you take the, you take the number of square feet, you multiply that by the desired foot Lambert level or the desired knit level, but it's easier to work in foot Lamberts. Yeah. Because uh, we know the square feet and we know the lumens and be with lumens and foot Lamberts, you can work out uh, lumens and uh, square feet, you can work, work out foot Lamberts. So it's okay. easier to put it all in those terms, right? So you take the number of square feet, you multiply that by your desired foot Lamberts, which in this case is 30. Right? Yeah, Instead of yeah. 15, the old way was 15, now it's 30. And then you divide that by the screen gain. So in this case, you divide it by 0. 0.8. 8. That will tell you how many lumens the projector needs to put out to hit that desired brightness. Right. And in his case, it's about 1,200 lumens. Right. right. So we were just talking about that Epson, which, I mean, at its brightest, it can do 2,500 lumens. So once you calibrate it, it's probably going to be down around 17, 1,800. That's so still you're in there. excess of what you need. Right. Well in, a, in excess. So I'm not concerned about any of the drawbacks he was concerned about with the center stage UF fabric from Seymour AV mm -hmm. and even the masking panels and putting his front left right speakers behind the, the, uh, the screen just like his center channel will be. Right. All of those, I can say, are not concerns that I would be worried about. Excellent. All right. So because for I, me, I, think I would love go. speakers behind a screen. I, I yeah, love yeah. what he's doing and it was, it's going to look fantastic. And it sounds like it's all within spec. Yeah, I mean, even if you went for the JVC HDR projectors, they top out at about 1,700 lumens. Once you calibrate them, they're down around 1,400, 1,500. You still have more light output than you need to yeah. do full HDR on the screen size that you're considering, right? Yeah, now, yeah. people who are looking at 135-inch, 150-inch screens, it changes the changes the, the the numbers you're throwing into that equation drastically, right? right. You have way more square feet now. So then you need a whole lot more lumens, but on this size screen, you can do it. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are we moving on to his part uh, C? C? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has a lot of parts. <laughs> uh, on Home Theater Geeks 178, Anthony Gramani gave suggestions of how to find the best locations to sit to avoid room mode. So that's just mm -hmm. picking where to put your rear end as that's opposed right. to doing anything to change it. Uh, using those guidelines, he's labeled them in the proposed room on the aforementioned chart of his room mm -hmm. in figure three as small red dots, okay? We always mention to avoid sitting in the middle of a room, yes. but two marked locations are quite close to the middle. Did he calculate wrong? Is our advice wrong? Is Gramani wrong? <laughs> um, right. So, so mm. it, uh, none of us are wrong. Uh, we're, we're in agreement, no <laughs> we're in agreement that you do not want to sit in the dead center of the room. And Anthony, Anthony sure. Gramani did a, had a great graph there, which shows you get multiple frequencies that have huge dips right in the dead center of your hmm. room. All okay. right. So you don't want to sit there because you can't really fix huge dips with EQ. Right. You can't do it because <laughs> no. dips can't dips it's, are there because the sound cancels out right at that point it's a cancellation right. effect not just a quietening right quietening. so he's saying okay sit if you if you need to be close to the middle of the room and nick does because he's got this small room and wants to sit close to his screen well move a little bit behind or a little bit in front of the dead center right, right? and he's saying even if it's just 0.55 of the length of the room or 0.45 of the length of the room rather than exactly 0.5, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that little bit extra. So in this room, let's say it's 18 feet long, right? We're talking about sitting at 9.9 .9 feet from the front wall rather than nine feet from the front wall. Gotcha. And even just that is enough to get you out of that null, that complete right. cancellation loss of sound. I mean, that's honestly so, just the difference between leaning forward on the edge of your seat and sitting up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so we're, you could, we're talking, we're talking about like sometimes less than a foot of difference, but you know, generally like one foot difference, right? At what frequency range would you be getting nulls from cancellation? Well, that on depends that on size. the exact dimensions of your room, right? of his room because yeah. the reason it cancels is because there's some frequencies that perfectly fit within the dimensions of that room. So when they right. bounce back and forth between the front and back wall or the, or the left and right wall or the ceiling mm -hmm. and the floor, in fact, when they bounce back and forth, they just happen to cross over with themselves as they bounce back and forth between those two parallel surfaces where they cancel out. Right. right? And one of the places where that's bound to happen is the dead center of the room. Yeah. So uh, none of us are wrong. <laughs> and if you can just make that adjustment to just be like we're talking, you know, what is it, nine, ten inches, right? Yeah difference that will be enough to get your your head out of the absolute null that you can't fix with any eq and that's all we're worried about so so, so far there's nothing undoable about what that's he's right. proposing it's that's so right. far sounding fantastic yeah. uh 
let's see. Nick currently has Sierra 2s for his front speakers, but he's been eyeing the Sierra RAAL RAL towers to replace <laughs> them. Right. He he knows they have output, uh, more output than, well, I, I, the wording here is a little strange. Sorry. He knows they have output that he really doesn't need in such a small room. Uh, but are there any other advantages of going with tower speakers other than just output? If so, how big are the improvements? And we kind of touched on that with another yeah. question earlier. It, it not necessarily any other advantage unless you need more of that upper base kind yeah, of. Yeah, I mean, it, when it comes room. specifically to the Sierra speakers from Ascend, you know, people the, the towers have this dedicated mid-range drivers that the Sierra 2s do not. Um, yeah. They have a larger ribbon tweeter um, you know, the, the one that's in the bookshelf Sierra 2 is a smaller ribbon tweeter. Sure. Um, and so, I mean, look, objectively, if you're measuring them in an anechoic chamber, the towers can deliver slightly lower distortion. They can there play louder, which he knows, and he doesn't need that. Right. Um, you know, but at, it's like, I have them. I have, well, I have the Horizon RAL speakers, um, and I have the Sierra 2s, and I'm a very critical listener. And yeah. if you put me in a blind test, I would not be able to tell them apart. There you go. Unless I was in a very large room and sitting far away from them and uh -huh. the, just the sheer base or sheer output capabilities was what I was hearing as the difference. But in terms of the timbre and the quality of the sound and the detail and the, the treble mm. extension and all of that, I can't hear the difference. I'm sorry, man. I mean, so that's I not the place to put the dollars. I, I really don't think so. And in no. this size room sitting this close, you don't need to go for the towers. You don't. Okay. And that's me, man. That's me saying Yeah, that, so. <laughs> that's Rob. And if, if anyone's obsessing, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you are getting it from Captain Obsess. So <laughs> you, he's telling you the truth. Uh, so, so far, again, this whole thing is coming together nicely. Uh, yeah. Next part, is there any downside acoustically to using Ascend HTM 200s as in-ceiling Atmos speakers? He can almost flush mount them in the drop ceiling if he mounts them on the first floor joists and cuts holes in the drop ceiling panels. Thoughts? Yeah, so he wants okay. to save ceiling height because he's, he's got a drop ceiling, so he's talking about the, his ceiling's only a little over seven feet, so he doesn't want speakers, you know, Hanging uh, on, down. Yeah. on ceiling speakers, you know, taking right. up another eight inches or something like that. Because then totally your tall friends sense. are running yeah. right into him. Yeah. yeah, so I mean... Uh, Using the HTM 200s as in wall when you're talking about a drop ceiling, like this isn't even drywall that you're cutting or right. putting them in there. Right? Yeah, totally fine. Sounds uh, great. Yeah, I, I'm, I might have them a hair proud of the very, you know, yeah, so just a little nudge percent flush. Yeah, but uh, honestly, it will sound totally fine. They're sealed speakers anyway, so you're not worried about backer boxes or a port firing up into that cavity right. or yeah. anything like that. This will work totally fine. Just bring them out just a little bit. Just a, just a hair. Just a hair, quarter inch. Uh, he was reading Gene's review of the Status Acoustics Titus 8T speakers on Audioholics and is a little confused about his distortion measurements. He has a table where he shows that at volume levels above negative 20 dB, the speakers exceed 10% distortion. Since many people listen to their systems between minus 20 and minus 10 with the money that those speakers cost and the amplification Gene is using, if he really... If he is really getting that much distortion at those listening levels, he can't imagine what the rest of us are getting. 10% is pretty audible, isn't it? Is he missing something? <laughs> yes, yes, you are, Nick. Uh, this was a misinterpretation yeah. of the data being shown. Um, what that table was showing was above that table, there is a graph. And the graph is showing the measured frequency response at the volume level uh, that he was playing the back, which I think is like 85 or 90 dB or something like that. And then on the same graph below it is another line, which is showing the total harmonic distortion level. And that's what the graph is showing. And the table below is just a table saying if the difference in decibels between the frequency response graph and the total harmonic distortion graph is this value, like total harmonic distortion is 10 decibels quieter or 20 or 30 or 40 decibels quieter than the frequency response graph, then that would equal this amount of distortion, right? So right. it's a way of reading the graph and saying, okay, between these two points on the graph, I have this amount of, of decibel difference. Uh, then I refer to the chart, how much uh, distortion am I looking at, right? So at all values on the graph, when Gene measured his speakers, it's like greater than close. It's like 45 or 50 decibels difference, right? Right. Which then you refer to the chart and everything is below 1%. Everything, mo almost everything is below 0.1% right, total right. harmonic distortion. So 
it is not saying that there are points on that graph where the difference is only 20 decibels and therefore he has 10% uh, total harmonic distortion. He's like, it's just a, a chart that you can refer to. So you can pick two points on the graph and say, how many decibels apart are they? And from that, refer to the chart and know how much distortion right. is going on there. So misinterpretation so, of the data there, Nick. Yeah, so at least he, he knew he was probably missing something. Yeah, there. yeah, that, yeah. So yeah, because 10%, no. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Nothing is happening like that in, in gene speakers. So that's what's going on there. All so, right. Okay, so we're, we're over two hours here. I don't mind going on, but Lee, I don't know. Maybe you have somewhere to go. So I can, I can go a little bit longer. Uh, it's mostly I'm just getting hungry. I, uh, I will leave. <laughs> I will leave it to you. You tell me when we stop, and we will stop. Okay. Let's let's do a couple more because okay. here we are, right? And these yeah. look like shorter ones. Uh, we're right. finally, if y'all can remember that uh, we we were once. Uh, not not talking about uh, questions from uh, uh, Nick, uh, and so <laughs> now now we're on to Martin B. Mm -hmm. uh, it, he's helping a friend put together a seven point one system. Uh, he remembers us saying that only Denon and Marantz currently offer receivers that are future proofed and that they already <laughs> have true support for four K and HDR. Can we recommend a couple of good choices from Denon and Marantz or any other brands that will do what he needs if he misremembered? what we've said <laughs> all the speakers will be paradigm so he's basically asking what's a good 7.1 that's got future proof for 4k and hdr yeah that's right so i mean uh, he, he didn't give an outright budget but i'm going to assume going 7.1 so, he's not you know super concerned with atmos and things like that yeah he doesn't seem to be mentioning atmos so that that gives you lots of options and and we pretty much already answered earlier in this podcast yes. why we're currently favoring Denon and Marantz, right? So sure. it's not that we think other brands are bad. It's nothing right. like that. Uh, the the, the thing, whole thing about future proofing was on Denon and Marantz, their models, all of their HDMI inputs and outputs, and on some of the models, it's like eight inputs and three outputs, right? Right. Every single one of those ports has the full HDCP 2.2 copy protection, HDMI 2.0A so that it handles HDR10, and the full 18 gigabits per second of bandwidth. All right. Every single go. one of those ports. Yeah. All the other brands, other than Yamaha's flagship models, right. all the other brands, it's only some of the ports. There you right? go. No, they you have, have to very carefully look and see which ones. Sure, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but that actually might be sufficient for quite some time. It depends on what oh, you mean course. by future proof, right? Of course. There is no such thing that you're going to buy and it's going to work forever for all the things. It's just yeah. not going to happen. It's uh, just all you're that, doing is extending the time period. Yeah. With, with the Denon Amaranth, you don't have to think about it because it's every port. Yeah. Then their prices aren't any more expensive than any of the other brands. And right. they have the other features we mentioned about more flexible Atmos setup, what we think is the better room correction and all that. You put all that together and it's like, why would you choose something else yeah, other than about, music cast, right? To me, yeah, that's the it's one feature features. set and yeah. uh, just fandom. You know, again, I love me some Yamaha just because I got hooked on it early in my life, actually, mm -hmm. from, from sound systems at my high school. I ran the sound system in, 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 at my high school, and it was a big Yamaha mixer amp with like 300 sure, watts, sure. and we had big concert speakers. And I just, I don't know, I loved it. It was my thing. That's the only <laughs> reason I went to basketball games, because I was doing the sound. <laughs> so, yay, Yamaha. But, uh, yeah, uh, it, you know what's going to happen. Something's going to be added in the future. Something's going to be yeah. more. Of it. And, and the real thing that's going to happen is everything you buy in this so-called future-proof uh, receiver uh, is going to be half the price in a couple of years. Well, sure, sure. So All those features are going to migrate down to the cheaper ones. One of those things is Mult EQ XT32, the highest level of Odyssey that's available, right? The most that's a feature that we really like. And as we mentioned, Denon MRS just announced new models. One of those new models is the Denon X3300, which is, of course, replacing the 3200. Yeah. The 3200 had Mult EQ XT. The X3300 has Mult EQ XT32. Aha. Uh -huh. It has the better version. This is the least expensive model that's had multi QXD32. And it sounds so, like that's worth making the jump to if you can afford it. And it could be, but the X3300 is $1,000 brand new. Yeah. And since it's brand new, we don't have the refurbished models from Accessories for Less just right, right. yet. It sounds like he wants to buy the system now. So that being the case, it's really hard to say spend $1,000 on the X3300 when for $900 you could get the X4200 or the SR6010 from Accessories for Less, yeah. which not only gives you XT32 just like the 3300 does, it also gives you nine speaker capability if you want to. It gives yeah. you 5.2.4 Atmos if you ever want to. So 
from that value proposition, if you have around $1,000 to spend, then mm -hmm. I would point you to the X4200 or the SR6010 from Reds. Right. So future reference for any listener, if you're asking for recommendations, please include a price range. <laughs> but I'm guessing he wants to spend less. And yeah, if that's the case, I would, I would point you to the X2200 uh, because that's like under $500 right now. You're wow. talking multi-Q XT, right? Yeah. It does not have any pre-outs. So if you want to add external amplification, you can't. But other than those two factors, and having multi-QXT is not by any means like a gigantic downgrade that to worry about. And given the price differential, right, it has all the other features you might be concerned with. So to me, that's like the value choice is the X2200. Of course, there is an X2300 that just came out to replace it. But there really weren't any changes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes they just they try anything they can to say they've made a, a, a big jump in features and quality. And they just I mean, they just you know they up they refresh their model lineup every year. So okay, yeah. there's an X2300 now, but essentially nothing changed for the X2200. So the X2200, a right. little bit older, you can find it cheaper, you can find it refurbished. To me, that's the value choice. All right. Now you said I could uh, end the podcast yes, at sir, will. Can. I'm noticing the next question is uh, looks pretty short. Okay. The one after that from Ted looks like it yes. has 18 parts. So we're going to stop. Late, so that's quite yeah. all right. So we're going to stop after John M. Uh, very on Twitter. Fair. All right. So uh, here we go with our uh, last question right now today. Uh, John M. on Twitter asks, what is a good neutral gray paint that can be easily found at home improvement stores? GTI Munsell gray paints can be ordered, but it's expensive. Sure is. Uh, it's $95 a gallon. I'm telling you, you know what you can do? The, don't. I, I think Tom feels the same way about this as I do. Uh -huh. You could go to Walmart and get middle gray, <laughs> just middle 50% gray, and, pretty, pretty and close. paint that paint on your wall, and it'll be fine <laughs> it'll however, be fine however if you're a real stickler i know there is an answer and because well sherwin williams okay sherwin williams pretty darn big paint brand you can probably yes. find a sherwin williams dealer within your area it's not like it's hard to find sherwin williams paint oh, they no. have a paint uh it's just called gray screen there you go and it is a very very neutral gray it falls right on that muscle scale now uh, we'll have the link to Sherman Williams site because gray screen is one of uh, several gray tints that are all the same shade, just mm -hmm. darker versions of each other. Right, right. And gray screen is actually the lightest version. So um, the, the location number within Sherwin Williams catalog, they all start with 235. All right. Right. So if you look up any of the Sherwin Williams 235 grays, you'll see all the uh, various darknesses of that particular gray. Uh, and you can choose the one that's as dark as you would like it. And that's a very neutral and probably pretty easy to find brand. Now, of paint. do they call it gray screen because of its usability as a screen? Because I don't know if that's exactly why, but lots of people true. have. Lots of people yeah, have done yeah, that. But they may be being fooled by the name of it, you notice, because the slightly right. darker one is just called online. That's right. Yes. So what does that have to do with anything? And the next one down is network gray. I think they're just using yeah. fancy sounding terms. Oh, yes. Uh, that's what so they do. I'm telling you. <laughs> Don't overthink it, because uh, I, I think uh, for a bathroom, I mixed up some beautiful, uh, 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 oh, starts with a G, what's it, Glidden. Uh, and it's just a middle gray. It's a perfectly neutral, halfway between black and white. But maybe maybe it's ever so slightly tinted blue. No, ever no, so it's not. Slightly... <laughs> no, it's perfectly gray. Don't <laughs> overthink it, guys. But okay, I mean, if you want something that happens to be called gray screen, somebody knew what they well, were doing. It's not, because, it's not because of the net. People have measured it, and they're like, yeah. this is Munsell gray. This okay, is completely so they... neutral, no shift towards any color. And it's from a, a large brand that you can probably find. So why Perfectly not? legit why choice. Not? And how much is Sherwin-Williams paint? Maybe it's $40? I, I don't actually know. It's, I, it's, I assume it, it would feel like it's probably something in that range. It's not $95 a gallon. I know no, that. No, nothing should be. <laughs> <laughs> nothing should be. Maybe the finest scotch should be $95 for a gallon. Anyway. So, that's, oh, yes. We did but, have Ted, uh, Ted as uh, Lee mentioned. Uh, we will get to your question next week, Ted. We also did have some other questions that I know that I fielded on uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and some yes. email. Oh, and that. I would love to get down to like the snake oil stuff because I love <laughs> that has been sitting into there for stuff. like a year. It's been like a year. I would love to dig into that because I love that stuff and you can just listen to me. It's it's called AV Rant and boy, I could help you and Tom <laughs> rant on stuff like that. I hate it. Uh, before as, we go, let yes. me ask a quick question to our listeners because I know there has to be some people out there who uh, do some of the things that I do and want to do better, which is uh, audio on a computer. 
Uh, I'm looking for sound card recommendations. Okay. Uh, and, and let me tell you what I'm looking for. Extremely simple. I need RCA inputs, clear, high signal to noise ratio, mm. nice, quiet, as the audiophiles like to say, black backgrounds. I just want a nice, clear signal. And I need just, I really just need a uh, uh, left, right uh, RCA in. And then I need, uh, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'm comfortable adapting it to eighth inch stereo. So it can be eighth inch stereo or it can be sure. RCA. And then output the same thing, analog, uh, eighth inch stereo is fine. RCA is fine too. And also I would like it to have simultaneous digital audio output. It can be coax, it can be uh, 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 optical. Okay, so I just need nice quality sound. The other thing it must have is very low latency, <laughs> very fast, right? Ah. So I wanna make sure that when we're doing stuff like we're doing right now, that uh, I don't get a delay in hearing my own voice mm -hmm. after it comes into the sound card and then comes back out to my uh, amp that I'm listening to. External, internal, does that matter? I don't care. What I want is okay. quality, and it has to be very fast so that I don't hear a delay on my voice if I'm listening to the analog input that then gets sent back out immediately to my amp. And right, right. now, I, I, I have that in a sort of cobbled together, crappy onboard audio kind of way. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and I have to kind of filter these files we generate when we're doing this podcast. So if anybody out there uh, does some, you know, good quality analog input, not super multi-channel, I don't need like eight lines or anything like that. I'm not mm -hmm. recording a band. I just need good quality left, right. This is going to be for, you know, high quality microphone input like I'm doing right now and for uh, sampling old analog sources. So what so, about like the Behringer? Like, what is that, the UAC-222? So Behringer has sound cards. I guess I could go look that up yeah. and maybe that would make sense. I have a Behringer uh, little 15-year-old uh, amp and I have a recent Behringer mic processor. Not amp, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm pretty darn Behringer sure it's mic the... mixer and a Behringer processor. Yeah, I'm pretty darn sure it's the 222. That, uh, so it's just an audio interface. It's external. It's USB. Yeah. And the thing does like no processing, so I know it has like no latency. Yeah, U UCA. I mixed it up. Uh, that was pretty good off the top of my head, huh? That's amazing. Like, yeah, it is. UCA amazing. 222. Uh, I don't know if that has simultaneous uh, analog and uh, digital. I would output. like that. I mean, I guess I could live without it, yeah. but I would really like to not ever have to switch. It, ha it has on digital and out, and it has analog out, and it has the two RCA ins. I just yeah. don't know if it's simultaneous, but well, if oh, it was, well, you can check perfect. it out. <laughs> so if my only concern is that, that whole latency thing, as the sound is coming in through the USB, and uh -huh. my computer is is you know mixing it with I'm listening to you over uh, yeah, Google yeah, Hangouts, yeah, yeah. No. and then it's spitting it back out again so I can hear it through my Yamaha uh, receiver. You just have to do everything with uh, ASIO drivers, right? That way you're bypassing any Windows processing, and it's just going everything's just going straight yeah. to whatever sound. Right, card because you if you uh, I've noticed even on my crappy onboard audio, uh, it has mm -hmm. its own drivers, and yeah. you can use its own drivers to turn up and listen to to monitor the line right, input right. and that has no delay but if i yeah. use windows monitoring of the line oh, input, no 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 yeah then it's like yeah, you, got, it has you gotta that. bypass windows that's for sure right okay so yeah. however it's accomplished i don't care <laughs> i just need immediate no latency kind of thing i need high quality analog in and analog out and a digital out and i'd love it if digital and analog happened at the same time yeah out. that's the only question i have on that uh, behringer one but uh, doesn't have to but I would not. I would like to not have to load a piece of software and switch. So if anybody out there has yes. recommendations, I'm going to go look at that Behringer. Uh, and you know, I I don't want to spend like hundreds of dollars. Oh, I no, that thing's cheap, man. That's like thirty bucks or something like that. Thirty. So, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Wouldn't it be neat if thirty dollars solved this problem I've had for ages? <laughs> I, I I shouldn't be quoted on that. It might well, be a little bit more, but it's, it's definitely not expensive. I'm comfortable to a couple hundred. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So, somebody tell me what to do. <laughs> you never know. You never know. If if that worked just off the top of my head, then yeah, that would be amazing. Have, if everyone would be dollar, impressed. Yeah, and it would be neat to have Behringer, 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 <laughs> you know, go. all in a row. That would be great. All right. Well, Lee, thank you so much for filling oh, in. This was well, thank you for having me. Pleasure. It's always yeah. fun. This worked out really well, I think. So, yeah. unfortunately, Austin wasn't here. We would, we really would have liked to have had Austin yes. around with us as well, but uh, but that's okay. He is busy today. Uh, Tom, hope your uh, reunion went well. So he'll be back next week and tell us. Is that all what about it was? It. Was it a, a, a yeah, high was school reunion? No, it was family reunion. Family reunion. Okay, so that's well, really still, nice. that sounds great. Yeah. Um, for for anyone who's listening live or, or hearing this before we record next week, uh, normally we record on Monday nights. Next week, Monday is July the fourth. Tom will be in no condition to record on Monday night. <laughs> 
So we, we will <laughs> I'll be, be at the beach. I will actually be at the beach. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> we will be recording on Tuesday next week. So uh, just a heads up on that. We've had weird schedules going over the summer, but that's the way it goes. At least we are still here to answer your AV questions each and every week. Yes. That's what we do on this podcast to get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You send it to question at avrant.com. That's our primary e- email address. Please also CC myself, Rob at avrant.com and Tom at avrant.com. That helps us out a lot. Uh, you can come to our website, avrant.com. We post the show notes there, links to all the things that we talked about. You can also, if you would like to, leave us a donation when you come to avrant.com. It helps support the podcast. Tom is still in the red because he's been doing this for nine years and wasn't taking donations yeah. to like a couple of years ago. That's so, right. So let, let, let's let's get Tom back up to zero. How about that? That would be right. awesome. And if you want to recommend a sound card to me, I'm at Lee Overtweet on Twitter. That's right. That's right. So uh, people did support the podcast financially. That was Jerry D this week, our listener of the week. Yay. Thank you so much, Jerry. And thank you to anyone whose name we missed. We will mention you next week, absolutely, when Tom is back. Uh, you can also visit us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Podcast. Our listeners are very helpful there. We try to answer when we can. Uh, Lee mentioned his Twitter. That is at Lee Overtweet. I am at first reflect. Tom is at AV rant underscore Tom. And Austin, our producer, is at Austin Pond. That's T E N Austin, not T I N T E N Austin. Austin has his own podcast. It's We Watch Movies. Uh, Lee, I All know you're about a fan. Quilting. All what? about quilting. Still? How did it, how did it remain? Qu- I, think it, I think they moved on to crochet. Cro- oh, that. well, I, uh, you're right. And some macrame <laughs> as well. Oh, yes. That's Remember what it was. macrame? They are macrame. bringing that back single handedly with that podcast. They kept it related. But right. macrame now, very good. That's that's excellent. We watch movies. You never would have guessed it from the title. Uh, so, <laughs> thanks again so much, everyone. Uh, we, we appreciate you listening, sticking in here for like two and a half hours because that always happens when Tom is away. Uh, but <laughs> particular thanks to Lee for sticking around so much. You're uh, welcome. For AV Rant, I am Rob H. And I'm Lee Overstreet. Now go out and listen to something. And hitting stop and...